All right, welcome to The Fresh Perspective. I'm here with John Joseph. Thank you for coming in. Thanks appreciate you. Thanks for having you. me, brother. It's it took a minute to make it happen. I know you're busy. We're all busy. I appreciate you taking the time Definitely, out today. Um, you know, the first episode on the road. I mean, even though we're in New York City, this is on the road for me. I'm not in my home studio. It's a little different, but I'm glad we got to make this happen. Yeah, man. Yeah. Appreciate you, man. Thank you. So for people who don't know you, maybe give a little background on kind of who you are, just a quick synopsis so people can be up to speed and kind of uh, where we're going. Started singing with the cro in 81, basically uh, wrote a bunch of books, grew up on the streets of New York, and... Uh, you are one of the rawest New Yorkers that I've that I've met. Like yeah. you, remind, you are quintessential, like, New York. When I think of New York, like, I think it reminds me of my uncles, like, you're just raw New York. I love that vibe. It makes yeah. me, like, comfortable to hang out with you, talk to you, whatever it is, because it's just... Some people might get thrown off by it. I'm sure when you travel, people are like, it's very in-your-face New York, right? Yeah, they... Th or if you... You know, especially with social media, pro people misconstrued, like, the shit. I'm like, they're like, yo, man. And I'm like, yo, it's the New York, bro. That's how we are it's in New raw. York. We don't bullshit. That's why we can go anywhere in the world and, and fucking survive. That's right. That's, uh, I mean, I'm 59 this year, so I was on the streets in the 70s and uh, probably around your uncles and, like, all of that. Probably were. But, uh... Yeah, you know, it's uh same with my brothers. We just uh had a had a rough upbringing and had to deal with whatever just kept getting thrown at us. So, you grew up in New York City? Uh yeah, well, I was born in New York and then uh my father, my father was uh, a pro boxer. He boxed uh uh over at Custom Autos when oh, he wow. was at Gramercy Gym. And uh and then he just you know, uh, wanted to be a, a gangster and loved the drinking, you know, from Ireland and shit. So it's like uh, we ended up getting taken out of the home. My mother got depressed. He was beating her up. How old were you when you got taken out? Uh, set 69, set like seven, almost seven years old. Oh, wow. Yeah, so then we went to like fucked up foster homes, like crazy shit happening. And uh, then they shut that home down. They found out what was going on. And, uh, and this is in the 70s. Yeah. This so I'm was sure the New early York City 70s. foster homes were not the best. No, this was in Long Island. Oh, shit. And then uh, that first I went to one in Brooklyn and then in Bay Ridge, actually. And then that one, the father got cancer, the foster father. Real nice people. And then they couldn't take care of us anymore. That place was okay before yeah, that? Yeah, they, they were nice people to us. Like, and you got sent to a nightmare spot. Then we got sent to the fucking nightmare um, we got separated. Me and my younger brother went to this house and the fucked up shit started. And then my other brother got sent to another foster home. And then it was like during the Vietnam shit. So the refugees was coming over and uh, the foster father was like molesting the Vietnam v Vietnamese Jesus girls. Christ. And then they found out about that, shut that house and then put him in with us. How many people were in the house? How many kids? Uh, I don't know. I don't know that house how many there were, but, but there was six in the house where we was in, and they was all getting money for having kids there, and then, you know, feeding us dog food and making Jesus. us sleep in the garage. Never allowed to go in the refrigerator. Fucking. And you're too young to even. And back then, it's less much less outlets to even talk about it. Who the fuck can you even tell it? Well, you know what? I did try to say something because the foster father used to beat the shit out of us, and then I had like bruises, and I went to school, and I tried to, like, we went there first in the summer, so it was like they just were doing crazy shit to us, and then when the school came, I tried to tell the, the nurse and the principal, like, hey, listen, and then they is... called him down. And he's like, oh, yeah, they make up stories to get back, but their mothers, you know, my mother was taking pills and shit at the time for depression. So then they they believed what the uh, foster father said because they're like, you know, none of the other kids are complaining. It's just he thinks that he's going to, and he, we left there. He takes me in his car to Pilgrim State Mental Hospital. So all the patients outside... And he drags me over to the fence, smashes my face against the fence. And all these, like, crazy fucking people are grabbing my face. And, like, he's like, if you ever say anything again, we're going to put you in here. No one's ever going to find you. And Jesus you're like a little Christ. kid. 
you know, you, 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 I mean, I would scare a grown man, never mind. A yeah, kid. I mean, dude, it was fucked up. And like, I never, we never said nothing. But then my older brother, E, started make, keeping a diary of everything they did to us, fed us. Like, this bitch made us fucking Oreo spit sandwiches. Like, scrape the Oreo filling off the Oreo and spit it in a bowl and put it on green molded bread. They fed us whatever rotten cold cuts. Tea with Cheerios. Like, we literally had to steal the dog's food to eat sometimes. Jesus Christ. Like, we were eating Alpo biscuits. Alpo and fucking milk bone dog biscuits. And, like, then we found out where they was keeping the money, and we started started stealing the money from them. At that point. Yeah. And then, like, then we just learned how to scam. Fucking that was it, man. How many years were you there? Like six years. Holy shit. Yeah, and then... Uh, so until you were like a preteen teenager. Yeah, I was... Uh, when I came out of there, I was uh, like, yeah, 13, pushing 14. And then we went to this house in, in Garden City in, in like late 75. And it was a really rich family. And like we had the same last name as them. What kind of part of Long Island was the first one? The what? The first house was what part of Long Island? Deer Park. And okay. then they put us in Garden City. All together, your brothers? Yeah. And they, uh, the, it was the, the president of the bank. And their last name, my name is John Joseph McGowan. And their name was McGowan. So it's like, you don't think of it, but like when you're in school, we were in the other foster home, we were like the free kids. Fucking everybody picked on us. And like, you know, it, it just made me become like, uh, you know, the first time this, they used to put out like green molded. Um, everybody was like, yo, why is their last name this and your last name's that when they sign? Like, it was just one. And, and then like they're making us climb into the poor box to take people's hand me downs and you show up to school with another motherfucker's, yo, that's my shirt. Like, you know, and all it's that. another type. reason to be an outsider. They're giving you basically. Yeah. Too. Then like we, 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 we started going into the, homeroom in the morning and and everybody would have their lunches in there and then we would hide in that closet and like eat their shit and uh you know so they made us go to school with rotten moldy sandwiches and put it in everybody else had lunch lunch uh boxes you know whatever the fuck and nice brown paper bags they put our lunch in a fucking Italian bread bag that long and they they didn't use saran wrap they used the old moldy wonder bread bags so one time I was like we were so embarrassed like we would open the shit up under the table and pull the sandwich out and hide it and eat it and then this kid fucking came up behind me and grabbed it and like you know sh like made fun of me to the lunchroom I just got up and I fucking decked that motherfucker <laughs> and fucking that was it but nobody fucked with After that, us no one again. took the sandwiches, I'm sure. And we started throwing all the lunches down the sewer. Everybody else's? On the way else's? to school. No, our oh, lunches. Yours. okay. So, like, it was just... I wrote about it in my memoir, The Evolution of a Cro-Magnon. It was just like, you know, you talk about, you know, your attitude being forged in fire. That was like, you know... It I was, want a lot of people listening to this that are complaining on a daily basis... Um, Myself included, I try to you know stay appreciative all the time. But a story like that, uh, I mean, just makes me very, very appreciative of the upbringing that I did have. My parents, you know, took care of me, and I never had a do. I never, I, I couldn't even fathom really dealing with that at that age. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the mental fortitude you must have built. Something like that either makes you or breaks you a thousand percent. And mm -hmm. uh, the fact that you've been su as successful as you have and have as strong as a mind as you have was definitely made during those, that time period. Like yeah. you could have you could have used it as, as an excuse every day of your life until you died and no one would have no one would have blamed you. Uh -huh. But you've made something of yourself and I think that's what probably was a big driving force behind it. I mean, it took a lot of blood, sweat and tears in between like that point to now. I mean, I always had resentment that my mother abandoned us, but I didn't even find out till I was 40 that my father raped her and that's how I was conceived. Jesus. Like, a, like through a brutal rape. And my mother decided, you know, everybody in the family told her to terminate the pregnancy. And she said she didn't do it. And, and it was the same thing with my younger brother. He was conceived out of a rape, too. 
My father raped her. He's a fucking animal. So I always held it against her. It took a lot of, like, you know, I talk about it in, uh, we had this, like, incredible moment, um, you know, on the, over the phone because uh, right before 9-11 and all that, I was dealing with uh, my brother's addiction and he was dying. So uh, I had to go do an intervention on him the day before 9-11 and I had him go into a rehab in St. Thomas. And then I had to literally go to Staten Island and pull him out of an attic. The lady told me if you don't come get him, he's gonna be dead. So then I took him on the ferry, came back, and then uh, 9-11 hit the next day. I couldn't get him on a plane for like a month, so he detoxed, and just everything came out. And my, you know, I confronted my mother. He knew when you didn't at that point, huh? He knew when you didn't at that point, your what? brother. No, I could. No, no, none of us knew. See, oh shit! Like when he finally got on the plane. I had conf what what happened was that I was doing well at the time um and my mother's husband at the time she got divorced to him and he had a gambling thing and he gambled away and took liens against the house Jesus. so she was homeless so when we was kids the one who didn't want us around was her boyfriend this guy Carl you know, cock blocking, like, I, he don't want three kids yeah. to come. So we had this, they, she kept promin promising us that we were going to come home, and it never happened. Because of him. Like, we would have, be yeah, because of him. So the, the thing that happened was that after my brother went to rehab, I got, I got her an apartment and furniture, everything. And she calls me up one day, and she says, I got to tell you something. I don't want you to be mad. I said, what? And then she said, I let Carl move in with me. The apartment that you just paid for. And that's when the shit hit the fan. And then uh, I just got it off my chest. And then uh, this was before the memoir came out. And I was like, you know, you always fucking picked. How could you let that dude move in an apartment like and, uh, yeah, he gets them. He gets them. The house taken away, causes them to be homeless. You come. No, no, it was her. She divorced her husband. So when she divorced him, he had taken liens yeah. against the house. Oh, that's not cross. So Someone she different? was homeless. So she went back with her ex boyfriend Carl, who was oh, there when we was kids. Got you. So now I follow. Like to have this dude move in with her, like you're living off my dime. It was just, uh, it was just, sure it was the last such a fucking, world you it was such a fucking kick in the, in the fucking balls, man. And, and I let her have it. And then she, you know, we kept, she's like, you know, I just told her, like, I just kept saying shit. She's like, stop, don't say that. I was like, and then she just broke down crying and told me her whole, the whole story that she never told me before. She kept saying, you don't know the whole story. And then she, that's the day she told me my father raped her and like beat Jesus. her down, almost killed her, like so many times. Like I, the last memory I have of him is right before we got taken away. He broke in and beat the shit out of my mother all over the apartment. Like he he used to just he would have to pay her child support through the court, and then she would cash the check and he would break in and take the money back and take all the food out of her fridge to feed us, to feed his girlfriend's kids. Jesus. And take our food so we would be starving. So, so a real like, animal is right. It's a good way to describe him. He's a fucking him. animal. And, and, uh, and, 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 you know, life, karma never loses an address. I always say that because Oof. the funny shit was... I like that. A few years back, my brother had to go to detox and get put in a medically induced coma to come off drugs to get heart surgery... And he's up in the VA in the Finger Lakes, and he's like, calls me up, and I was like, yo, what's up? He's like, yo, you're not going to believe this. And I was like, what? He's like, I checked into the VA, and the nurse looks at my chart, and she goes, oh, Frank McGowan, are you any relation to John McGowan? He's like, yeah, John Joseph McGowan, that's my brother from the Cro-Mags, and 
She's like, no, John Emil McGowan. And he's like, that's my father. And she said, John Emil McGowan is your father? And he said, yeah. She goes, I'll be right back. She goes, she leaves and comes back. And he goes, what's your mother's name? He said, Marie. And your two brothers are uh, who? John and Eugene. And she said, your father's dying in the next room. Jesus Christ. Yep. And he was homeless. And he fucking had nothing. And he sent in the priest to ask for, for, for forgiveness. And my brother said, tell that motherfucker to go to hell. And uh, he died. They moved him to another facility. And then he died. I just found out. He, so I just had relatives call me from his side of the family like just like a month ago contacting me on Instagram and like yo I'm your cousin I'm like what <laughs> and then yeah. she started filling me in on all the on all the details how like my uncle Skipper met him out by the Palladium outside Gramercy Gym and this dude started shit with them and my uncle was protecting my like the people they were with and he got murdered he got stabbed to death in front of by Gramercy like just filling in all the pieces of like things all you never got crazy up. shit that my father did yeah so that's a that's a crazy day I'm trying to get into that mental space so you're confronting your mother basically on a, a, a on betraying you in I a mean, situation we were, we were we were abused like physically sexually the whole shit these motherfuckers was animals toward us and then when I left that place, I said, there ain't nobody putting their hands on me ever again. And that's when I went on the streets. I was just, like, ruthless. I was about to say that. I would just put, to say. if you was bigger than me, I'd pick up a fucking pipe, a bottle, a knife, whatever, and just fucking handle it. You know, that's... But just to take a step back, that when that happened with your with your mother, you're saying that that, that day when you basically had to, when you confronted her on everything and then she told you the real story, how old were you at that point? Uh, I was 40. And you were already successful at that point. You'd already had. I was already doing bands. I, I I was working on movie scripts and stuff, and that's what kind of brought it all to a head. I was I was adapting my story for for a screenplay, and um, I based the main character on my childhood. And then um, I was working with my writing partner at the time, and you know we had a relationship together too. So, like, while we're writing it, it was very personal. But, like, I always, she always said, I knew there was something you wasn't telling me about the whole thing. So, um, it was the older kids that was, like, 17 and 18 that was doing shit to us and threatening us as kids. When you were in Deer Park. Yeah, so, like, I just woke up. I had this dream that I was, they used to make us sleep in the garage, and the dude, the dudes just came and like, like ripped the blankets off me when I was sleeping, and I, I don't know what the symbology of that shit was, but it was just like, I was just laying there in the cold, and then I just woke up like bawling, dude. I was like, and I just told her like all the shit that went down, and then when that same day, yeah, that same. Well, heavy... it happened a little. I told her. But then shortly after that came 9-11 and then dealing with that shit with my brother, it just opened up a lot of old fucking wounds yeah, that heavy. I was like, you know, yeah. Because like me and my brother got past all of it, but he's still an addict. And now it's at the point where like, all right, be a fucking man and pull your pants up. You got, you can't stop. You got to stop blaming Ma for all your shit that you're doing. Yeah. Like, you know, he just had another stroke. That's why the last time. So now, because the VAs, they won't even give him the rehab that he needs right now. He was he was in the Army? Navy. He's in the Navy? We all were. Oh, really? All three of us, yeah. Okay, so how do, so take me through, how does that happen? So you, you, you go to Deer Park, obviously that terrible situation. You get moved to Garden City, which, I'm, which sounds like which it was a... Which we didn't, we didn't even last... They, we showed up there with no possessions. They're like, where's all their clothes? We had nothing. Jesus. We had a fucking garbage bag with a couple of t-shirts in it after being in a house f for six years. 
We showed up with nothing. At that point, isn't and the these people obvious? Were, I just don't understand. Well, they were like, oh, yeah, well, you know, the, the social worker kept making excuses, but he dropped the ball because he would never clearly just show up unannounced at that Deer Park foster home. He would fucking let them know when he was coming, and then they would scare the fucking shit out of us. Put on a that show. if we open our mouth, they would go buy us new clothes and put on it. Yeah, we had just to put on day. a whole show. This, that system, just from the little I know of it, just sounds like a horrendous system with yeah. so many holes in it that you hear horror stories it's of this crazy. all the time. It's crazy, like the shit that they was getting away with. They had new cars. They had two kids of their own who got everything. And they would eat in the house and make us stay outside in the cold in this, like, patio. But, like, why? They're just sick They're people? Just they got pleasure out of that somehow? They're just sick fucking people, man. There's some sick fucking people and you think they there. got pleasure out of that some, for some reason? They got money out of oh, it. Oh, money, and that's the, right. And, and, and the power of, like... Telling someone what they, they can ran, and They ran do. a slave camp. That's what they ran. Fucked we had to up. do all the work. And the bitch was so twisted. She, she didn't even want to waste electricity. She had all six kids on our hands and knees with brand new toilet bowl brushes, brushing her carpet instead of running a vacuum. The bit, we all had to bathe in the same water. It was just like, a horror it was story. fucking crazy. Like, like, how could you do that shit to kids? And you know, you want to love them and everything at first when you get there, and then they just keep fucking abusing you and doing shit, and you're like, then you fucking just hate them. Yeah, like, you I just want to fucking get a kitchen knife and go in there and fucking stab them. I can imagine. But like the Garden City people realized we was damaged goods, and they were like, "Yo, you gotta get these fucking kids out of here." Damn. So then they put my younger brother in a home in the Five Towns in another foster home. They split you guys up again. Yeah, and then me and my older brother went. You E went to St. John's Home for Boys in 1976 in Rockaway Beach. How old was he at this point? He's, he's, he's 15, you, I right? was 14. Okay. He's a year older. So then we got there, and that's when the whole real fucking shit started, man. It was like, they're, you know, we they called Rockaway the Irish Riviera. It was all... I used to live in Rockaway. That's, yeah. that's where I grew up. So I was like... As a very small kid. I was on 110 on the boardwalk, St. John's Home for Boys. My house is on 128th. All right. You live right by uh, Jimmy Francis. Brady. Jimmy, St. Francis de Sales. Yep. Right That's my bro younger brother's name is Francis de Sales McGowan. He was named <laughs> after that church. That's where I did made my uh, my communion. Yeah. 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 I got my my friend I trained on. Well, he got injured on the job FDNY, but he's on 129. Jimmy Brady. That's His whole family's like fire department and. Every, that's over there. It's like the yeah. I'm, I'm part Irish too. It's everyone's a fireman. The Rockaways. Cops, firemen, is, FBI. But the thing was, I started going buck wild, and then. Every time the black and Spanish kids left the property, they got beat down by the by the Irish kids in the neighborhood. So they took that shit out on us. When they got back home. Yeah, no, when we got. I'm saying when they got back to the house. When they got back, same yeah. I was in three B over there, and then uh, I went on. I kept. I went on to the streets, and uh, I sold drugs to an undercover. That was my first charge. How old are you at this point? Is it 16, 17? 14. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, dude. I was out there running fucking wild, man. Wise Rockland? beyond my years. Yeah, I was hanging out with the Ramones on 116, like, in the summertime. So I split from St. John's because there was a dude in there. So my brother split with these junkies in Broad Channel, and he was like, like their gig was stealing meat from the supermarket to get high and then my brother started fucking with the dope because i see and he was 15 Damn. and i seen him and he had yellow jaundice i barely recognized the motherfucker takes and, over your life fast yeah yeah man he was in with some fucking hardcore people and then uh i was hanging out with like the hustling like i hung out with this dude jimbo sterling who had a hot dog stand on 98th Street, so you would get off the the train to go to Playland, Rockway Beach Playland yeah, at 98th that. Street. <laughs> I grew up in there. And when you got right there, there was a hot dog hamburger stand. So we used to put the drugs inside the buns. And sell it like that. So then, like, you would come up. So these undercovers set us up from the, night, from the 100 Precinct. And then that was my first case. I got popped. And I ran... Because when I got there, they said, Jimbo was like, yeah, I, I forget, bring a quarter pound or whatever. Uh, and then, like, when I got was there. Was it weed? Yeah. But he sold heroin, too. 
Oh, I didn't that's... fuck with that yet. That came later when I finally split for good. I was a mule for these junkies in Rockaway. So then when I got there to the hot dog stand, like I see all these these people that we was, the dude looked like Greg Allman, like a biker and then his chick and all this shit. They, she had long hair. And then when I got there, I was like, something ain't right. And Jimbo just turned around slightly and I saw that he was handcuffed. And then I split and I ran up onto the subway platform and they caught me. Fuck. And then they beat the shit out of me. They tied me, <laughs> they handcuffed me to the radiator and they're like, you're gonna learn the first lesson of being a criminal, never run. And then St. John's took me back and then- Did you get punished for that? At that age, what did they do with you? They just, well, I had a court case and then um, I split again and they, I got busted for breaking into the roof of a supermarket through the skylight. We were gonna rob the safe and whatever the fuck we could get. And the cops- And you're how old at this point? You're still 14? Still 14. And then the cops caught us, like somebody snitched on us. And then- uh, During while it was happening or afterwards? No, while the night we was gonna go do it. It was crazy because the dude worked there and he set us up. He must have got cold feet. No, nah, because he the dude already. I was with was like fucked his girlfriend, so uh, it was like a revenge thing. It's he always set a us fucking up. chick. And then um, cops, the floodlights came. They're like, "All right, assholes, get down!" And then St. John's wanted to send me to Spofford, and I've just fucking put on a whole fucking show. I'm like, please. I swear I'm gonna fucking change. But you were already on. You were already waiting trial for your first case. At yeah, this point. but the other thing was they had the records of my past, so they know what went down in the home. I said I got a problem with drugs now, all this shit. They said this is your last chance. If you do anything else before your court cases, you're going right to Spofford. That's the juvie. That's 21 and under where you don't want to go yeah. in the South Bronx. Yeah. So, um, what happened was there was this dude in there. He was the only other white dude, and he was like half Puerto Rican and half white. His name was Bobby Bobby K. When he was a kid, is that St. John's? Yeah, he was a big mother. This dude was like five ten, two twenty, all muscle, except when he was four years old. He was playing and woke up his mother his mother's boyfriend who was an alcoholic and the dude took him to the bathtub, doused him in lighter fluid and set him on fire. Fucking day. And then the mother lied and said that the kid was playing with matches and this and that. Did it to that. himself. Did it to himself. And then he went through all kinds of psychological lockups and he was like 19. Was he covered in burns and everything From too? the neck down, he was burnt. Wow. But everybody was terrified of him. Even it's the like counselors. Freddy, Jack Freddy oh, Krueger. He was like, no, not no Freddy Krueger. He looked Same like the, the motherfucking burns. thing. <laughs> yeah. Like, that's how fucking thick this dude. And we would huff Vandalex and Carbona, which that was what was big back then. It wasn't, we huffed like the shit they take graffiti off with Carbona. Mm -hmm. And we would just go into like five hours under the boardwalk in Rockaway huffing and then he would just come up and lose his mind and just start fucking just beating people down. He was an animal. A lot of anger issues, I'm sure, deep embedded so there. So the, the, the reason I had to split was that we took acid together and he had a bad trip and tried to kill me with a hunting knife and I hit him over the head with a chair and it became this whole big thing and I and that's the last time I split. Then I went onto the streets, and I moved in with these junkies. At and you're on the run still from two cases yeah, at this point. Yeah. And now homeless. N and, and homeless. And 14, 15 and years old. And with the thing Freddy Krueger trying to kill you. Well, at, at that point, it was January '77, and I went and slept under the boardwalk on 116. And then this snow fucking blizzard hit, and then. I just woke up soaking cold. I went to this place, Martin's Corner, and I was gonna break into the pinball machines to rob the pinball machine, the, the quarter boxes that's in there. Mm -hmm. And there was a junkie in there named Mike Debris. And he was already gonna do it. He had a screwdriver. <laughs> so like- 
He has to come up with the same pinball that's machine. How, Fate. That's how we met, and then he, then it got to be like, well, we need somebody to go cop for us on the, in Alphabet City. It's too hot for us. And They'll you're send you a in fucking there. 15 year old kid. They're never gonna suspect you. And that's how all of that shit started, like on the streets and. For those of you who don't know Rockaway, uh, people maybe non-New Yorkers, even some New Yorkers aren't really know Rockaway. It's this little cut, very super interesting area. Uh, I lived there from the time I was like, you know, one to like seven years old, uh, super early child. And then I still have friends that are over there. My my, my mother loved over there because it was the beach. She loved the Irish, you know, yeah. atmosphere, whatever it is. But it's, it's a super weird, like, melting pot because you have – it borderlines, like, over there. So you have Ponset which is like a mostly religious Jewish area with a lot of money. Then you have Rockaway, like, you know, Breezy Point type of area, which is mostly Irish, uh, you know, a lot of firemen, lifeguards, cops, that kind of thing. And then when you go more east, uh, you come into Far Rockaway, which is uh, mostly predominantly black and one of the roughest neighborhoods in New York. The period. Hamill houses are fucking crazy. Yeah, the whole area I is just very, very, very now, dangerous. Training, I go through Far Rock when I come off. A lot the of money going in there now at a new building, but still, yeah. it's risk. Still, it's still it's dicey. Yeah, so you had like Far Rockaway. If you went to the left, if you went to the right, you had Rockaway Beach. And then Bell Harbor, and then if you went further, you hit Breezy Point. I'm oh, sorry, yeah, Bell Harbor, that's yeah. right. Yeah, Bell Harbor. So when I went onto the streets, that's what I did. I, I broke into all the houses in Bell Harbor at night and stole shit from the garages and then would take Tools it, and stuff? Fucking lawnmowers, hedge trimmers, fucking chainsaws, bicycles. Yeah, I had my bike stone as a kid there. My huffy. Yeah, this was like 77, though. But no, no, yeah, this is the You know, 90s, it was just, that's what it was all about. It was about hustling and, and doing whatever the fuck you had to do. So now, But now you're on the street. Now you're in survival mode, basically. Not basically, you are in survival yeah. mode. You're doing whatever you can to eat every day. How long before that do you end up, how does that transition happen from a kid with clearly lost at that point to getting into music? Like, where, how, well, that I was always, see, I was into punk rock because, like, As when I was a kid, when I was a kid, we found this little round TV on the street. Back in the 70s, they had those round TVs, and we stuck a coat horn hanger in it. So we used to sit in the garage... And it worked. ...and watch Soul Train, and I was into all the fucking black music back in the day. But then, like, when I got to... Then, I remember in Garden City, I heard, like, David Bowie and the Stooges and all that shit. I was like, yo, this is, like some other shit, and I started going down and checking that out. As a matter of fact, I, 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 uh, in Garden City, they took a shopping, and I made them buy me all fucking platform shoes, like black clothes, and then I had the <laughs> David Bowie haircut. They, so <clears throat> Garden City was all preppies and shit, and they, my nickname there was Bowie in the school. That's funny. Like, they were bugging out. But then... Uh, like, it didn't stick out enough already. You know, it, it intrigued my interest. And then in 77 was the summer of punk. So you had the Ramones hanging out. And that song came out, Rockaway Beach. And I'm like, that's what I was doing. I was hitching, you know, going to the city at night to the punk clubs at 15 years old. And then, like, you know, hitching back to Rockaway, hanging on the beach all day, selling drugs, like... And I'm on 116, they called it the circle. St. John's is on 110. So that just shows you how disconnected that place was from the whole neighborhood. And I earned my bones because the second time when I left, I was in the Holland House. It was this abandoned hotel on 115. And I, I was sleeping in there, and this girl climbed in bed with me, and nothing even happened. I was all fucked up. So I woke up in the morning, and I, I I hear, where the fuck are you? I'm gonna beat your ass. It was her, her boyfriend. boyfriend, this crazy <laughs> motherfucker, Danny McGill. Another He's Irishman. a famous motherfucker in Rockaway. That's funny. So he comes, breaks in, he fucking pushes into the room where we are, and I'm face down. He just whacks me in the back of the head with a fucking pipe, Oof. knocks me the fuck out. I go to the hospital, and the cops wanted me to snitch on him. Did you even know? I mean, you were sleeping. You yeah, I knew who it was because I found out that it was Danny McGill. He told, yeah, I fucked that kid up from St. John's. and So the cops wanted me to snitch on him, and I didn't snitch. So then I got in good with the people in the neighborhood. 
because I'm not a rat. He was like the local tough guy, Dan McGill? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Dan McGill was a tough motherfucker. He was like one of the toughest fucking Irish motherfuckers out there. It was like, you know, he... he and then his cousin was this other guy, Philip Beggy, who was a bully. And then, uh, yeah, so by the time I went back onto the streets, I was hanging out with, like, Kevin Crowley, who was a boxer, his sister, Con like, I was a just... tough crowd. Tough, yeah, tough fucking crowd. So now... And they accepted me. They, like, took me into the, you know, into the, into the fold... But then I, the guys I was robbing the houses with were from Greenpoint, Brooklyn. This dude, Dougie, uh, Dougie Nuts, uh, Junior <laughs> Nuts and Dougie Holston. Crazy motherfuckers. So Junior Nuts sliced up this girl's face with a broken bottle, one of the locals. And that's that was it. I had to split Rockaway. And then I went to Forest Park and then I started selling dust. And that's what got... How old were you at that point? I was 15. Still all, still all this by yeah, 15. Yeah, all of this is like... 76, I started going on to the streets. 77, early, I fucking went full-blown onto the streets. And then it was... 78 is when I caught the dust case. You know, the crazy shit is there was this dude and uh, they called him Muscle Mike in Forest Park. And he worked for Where this, is Forest Park? Uh, Woodhaven Boulevard. Okay. Um, it's Forest Hills or it's... No, Forest Park is like... I don't know the actual... I forget, forget the fucking town. So when you go to Queens Boulevard and then you make a right... Because this is the way... I ride by there every time I ride to Long Island. You take Queens Boulevard and you make a right on Woodhaven and then you start going out Woodhaven. As soon as you get over is, right? that first... Yeah, Forest Park is on the right. Okay. I forget what town... It, it's in or whatever the fuck, but uh, yeah, it's a big park right there. And at and the they were dome, a lot of drugs there. everybody used to sell drugs at the dome. It was like the fucking supermarket, open air market, open yeah. air market. You come in with your car, say what you want. So I sold dust for this dude, and uh, he was the muscle in the park. He was mob. Nobody. He was the only disco dude in the park. He Italian looked like guy. John Travolta on steroids. <laughs> And we were the only ones allowed to sell dust in that park. And some shit happened. We sold this fucking guy's sister dust. And she jumped out of the second story window of a family's house. And he came in there and blasted. And I got shot with a twenty two. And the dude took us back to his house. Still at 15. Yeah, 15. I spent 16 in Spofford, my sweet 16. You've seen a lot this. of shit by 15, huh? Yeah. Oh, dude, it was, it was nonstop. It was nonstop. Sounds like it. And um, they, uh, we went back to his house, me and this, like, his little disco protege kid. And he was able to take the bullet out of my leg, but he put, um, he slipped me and Mickey and the kid of Mickey. He put drugs in our fucking drink, and I passed out. And I woke up with him trying to carry me with this to his bedroom with like this crazy look in his eyes. And I just was like, yo, what the fuck are you doing? And I started fighting him off and he just dropped me and stood over me and then walked away and I passed out again. I woke up to some horrific fucking screaming from the back room. And I walked back there and he was raping that other fucking kid. The muscle guy? The muscle guy was raping the other fucking boy, yeah. And I hit him with a fucking bat this is some Pulp Fiction shit. I robbed his house. I took his dust, all that shit. You knocked him out? Beat the fucking shit out of him with a bat. And then when I went to Forest Park, I ended up getting I ended up getting arrested, and that was the last straw. The reason I'm even bringing that shit up, somebody just sent me the news article from 1978 about that guy. And what the news article said was he raped the nephew of a mob-connected guy and they jammed the broomstick up his ass on the oh, up Mike Muscle. We called him Disco Mike. We called him Disco. They called him Muscle Mike. They broke a broomstick in his asshole and chopped him up and put his body parts all over fucking Queens. I think it was like 
Genovese crime family, someone in there. They this guy raped his nephew. I don't know who you're fucking and with. And nobody, man. nobody ever said anything of what this motherfucking animal was doing because they were scared of him, also embarrassed. Yeah. That's what happens in a lot of situations like that, I'm sure. You don't want to say nothing. Yeah. And plus he's like carrying a fucking forty five. I'll shoot you in the fucking head. Nobody's gonna believe you anyway. But then he like, with some connected and people. then I got caught right after that. They caught me at the dome, and then they wanted me to like snitch, and of course I didn't. They offered me Samaritan drug house, Samaritan drug program. I was either gonna do four to six upstate. They were saying was a possibility, or you're gonna do a uh, a year in Samaritan if you cooperate and tell us who's supplying the dust. I come from the world where you don't snitch on people. Yeah. So I said, I don't know. They just dropped it off to me every day. I, and then they sent me to Spofford. And then I went upstate from there. So at this point, you're a punk music fan. I liked punk rock. But you weren't making... I was, I was going to Max's, CB's, the whole shit. I wasn't making music yet. Okay. So now you get shipped up to Spofford. Spofford That's the place in the, in the Bronx, Bronx that you don't want to be at. I was in, I was in, I was in B3, which the is roughest the... roughest juvie... Yeah, in New York. the cops took me up there from Kew Garden Central Book, and they're like, the last white boy we brought up here was two Irish cops. They're like, they stabbed that motherfucker to death. And then, like, you're getting in there, and then as soon as I got to Indoc, this big-ass brother was like, you're going to be my fucking Maytag, white boy. I didn't even know what a Maytag was. I still don't. But I said, nah, motherfucker, you're going to be my Maytag. And then everybody started laughing. <laughs> And I said to the Puerto Rican cat, I was like, yo, what the fuck's a Maytag? He said, you just told that big motherfucker he's going to have to clean your sneakers, your shitty drawers, and be your bitch. I was like, as soon as we got to the wing, the dude fucked with me. I just, to the TV lounge, I just picked up a chair and cracked it over his fucking head. You should be a WWF wrestler. You like nah, the chair yo, attack, huh? I, I, the chairs, bro. <laughs> I told you, it's the equalizer. Shit, yeah. But that's like... And I had a few more fights after that, but once the motherfuckers saw, like... You weren't you're nothing to be messed I'm with. I'm not the one. You weren't easy prey. And I was good in sports. So I was playing handball with the Spanish cats and b-ball with the brothers. And, and in their respect there, too. Yeah, like, you know, I was a lot of people don't realize a lot of, It's a lot of jungle rules with, with men in general, especially when in a situation like that where everyone's there and everyone's kind of been in trouble. It's You got to... People always they say to me too. I'm, I'm a shorter guy, right? And if you go to certain neighbors, people are, aren't you worried or whatever? And it's a lot of times they pick on people who are showing fear. They don't want to fuck yeah. with somebody who's going to be a difficult time. Yeah. They want the easy, the easiest That's way. That's what they want. When the lions hunt, they don't go for they, the biggest buffalo. They go for the, the baby one. or the one with a bad leg. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the kind of how usually it goes. And once you show them, kind of listen, this is not going to be an easy day for you. Now, nah, okay, yeah. leave that guy alone. Crazy Irish dude, let him. But they let went. Him rock. They they put me in. They put me in. Uh, in. Uh, the break room, they called it, which was the padded room, because not only did I put a chair over his head, they were lining up for dinner, and I walked up, and I knocked his boy out, who was standing on the line, getting ready to file out. You know, each wing is locked down. Yeah. And then you file up. Who had, You didn't... Was din like dinner was optional. Dip dinner was optional. Well, it was individual cells. You're locked in, but it was doors. It wasn't like bars. Okay. Spofford was like like locked, thick-ass doors to, to your cell. But it's institutional. It's yeah. your... Oh, it's institutional. Yeah, the cops told me, even if you get out over that fucking 50-foot wall and the razor wire, you're not making it out of this neighborhood alive. Look at the South Bronx. It was Spofford Avenue, Hunts Point in, in the fucking 78. Yeah. It's like... War zone. Fucking war zone. So now how long were you there for? I was there for three months, and then I went upstate. I got sentenced finally, and I did 18 months. And in where? Uh, Lincolndale, upstate. That's a ju another juvie facility? Yeah, juvie, yeah. So was the spot for a place like a holding spot? It was attempted murder on, on, yeah, it's like Rikers for 21 and gotcha. under at the time. Gotcha. And then you get sentenced. I got remanded twice, right? First month, remand, that means you're going back to Spofford. Second you're getting in trouble upstate. No, you were there? when you're in Spofford, you got to go to court. So okay. if they can't figure out what they, what they was trying to figure out what the fuck they was going to do. And my court-appointed attorney was trying to, you know, present my whole, like, this is what this kid went through type shit. So I got remanded twice. Remand means you're going back to Spofford and you got to come back to court. So I had to go back. I got remanded twice. Back to Spofford. 
Second time, I helped this Puerto Rican cat escape off the bus. There was one window that, like, if you On kicked it bus? hard enough, the gate, the gate, it was the emergency. If you kicked that window hard enough, the whole fucking window came out. So he said, yo. This is the transport bus? To and transport from? Transport bus from... Uh, upstate. That from upstate, from Spofford to court. Okay, okay. So I had to go to Queens court because I, I committed crimes in Queens. Yeah. So they drove me from the Bronx. So the cat says to me, yo, we're sitting in the exit row. When I kick that fucking window open... I just need you to block the the, Buy me some the time CEO or something, yeah. <laughs> so I can get out. So he gets up, the bus is, pulls away from a light. He, he leans in the seat, bam, kicks the fucking window. You guys cuffed? No, they didn't cuff us. We didn't cuff us on the bus. And then uh, the CEO comes running down, and he's like, pick. "Get the fuck!" I was like, "Yo, yo!" Like I blocked him. <laughs> And the guy got away. So then, like, all his boys in Spofford were like, yo. He's good. Yeah, he's good, he's money. good to go. <laughs> but then the second time, so then the third time is when they said, all right, you're going 18 months upstate. My brother was already up there. And okay. he was running shit. Where was your younger brother at this point? My younger brother was still, my younger brother was still in the five towns. At that foster home. home, okay. Yeah. And then uh, my brother was like a drug smuggler. Like, he was getting drugs into the facility where we was at. So, like, he was in... Uh, the different wings were, like, the Oak, this and that. I was in the Elm. He was in a senior unit and, like, was getting uh, drugs into the place. And, like, my brother used to throw down, too. So, like, fucking... I went in there having a little bit of, like, yo, oh, he that's, had the block. Yeah. that's E's little brother right there. Respect. Yeah. Like, we pass each other in the chow hall. Like, they'd be like, yo. So, like. Another crazy Irishman in the building. Yeah. And then, like, they. And when I went in there is when they was doing the Scared Straight program. They took us to Rawway. They took us to like Fishkill Maximum Security Prison. We was. I was in the Elm unit. We was the first ones to ever go into Rawway State Prison. Where is that? That's in Jersey. It's okay. called New Jersey uh, State Penitentiary now. But it was called Rawway. So they had the lifers group, and they took us in there, scared the fucking shit out of us. What were they doing? Like, they make you sit in the auditorium, put all your sneakers. Like, if you say shit, they were smacking kids. They yeah, took a little this different one than now, kid. I'm sure. We was the first They can't one, actually touch you now. The, no, they can't. But the ones that made it to the TV show was another place called Hawthorne. If you watch the original TV show, we didn't make it to the TV show because... They were smacking kids. <laughs> like That's crazy. And the, they would make you like, all right, you're my bitch. Hold on to my shirt, motherfucker. And like, like literally scaring the shit out of you. And there was this dude, he got his eyes stabbed out with a pencil. And he's like, if any of y'all motherfuckers come in here, yo, my nickname is Tripod. I will be fucking every one of you motherfuckers. Like, <laughs> oh, like, God. Like, well, that's a deterrent for crime, yo, maybe. like crazy shit. And the thing was, you were scared for maybe a couple weeks, and then... But when you went home, you were like, yeah. Because at first when we went in there, we all had attitudes, and they picked up on that shit right away. They're like, you think you tough, motherfucker? Yeah. Like... You ain't shit in here. You ain't shit, motherfucker. Every one of you motherfuckers will be our Maytag and... The like, Maytag line's hilarious. I gotta use shit. that on somebody to make fun of one of my boys. Yeah. Maytag. If you say Maytag, motherfuckers know you're from old school. Yo, that, that motherfucker was a Maytag, yo. What's it like a, is that like an appliance Like a washing machine. Yeah, okay, like, yeah. yo. Yeah, I got you. You my bitch, basically, is what they're telling you. <laughs> you're gonna be cleaning my so, drawers. So, like, I got out of there, and the thing was, I had no skill set. How old were you when you got out of the uh, six, upstate? I was, uh... I was turning 17. I was no, you're 17. 17. You're homeless. You have a rap sheet. No, 17 went on to the streets again because they saying. released me to my mother. So before you get out uh, there, they make you have home visits to start trying to... Because if, you're, your if you're a short timer, why are you going to split? You're getting out in two, three months, four months. So you're not going to fuck up. Yeah. So they start sending you home for visits to reacquaint yourself with where you're going to be going when you get out. And my mother tried, but we just didn't have nothing in common. Where was she living at that point? 
Uh, Jackson Heights. Okay, so still Queens. 81st between 37th and Roosevelt. So you finally get out of Lincoln and you're 17? Uh, just about to turn 17, yeah. And they try to bring you back to your mother. That doesn't work. Well, I, I split. Yeah, so you're back. So that's what I'm saying. And then so. I went back on and I caught another case for possession with the intent to distribute. For dust again? Uh, heroin. Okay. And then uh, I was still considered a minor. So my mom's at the time was dating a recruiter. I was looking at going upstate again. And he got all the charges buried and said, you sign up for the Navy for four years. We'll get you out of this And shit. you're going to go in on the buddy program with your older brother. So I said, yo, the state didn't raise no fool. I took the Navy and then... Probably the best thing you could have done at that time. Yeah, I mean, thing was, we used to ship out from um, Fort Hamilton in Brooklyn. Yeah. You Bay know Ridge. that area. Yeah. And uh, my brother goes to me, like I literally came from lockup and then did the physical, did all that shit, passed the ASVABs, which is the, um, it's like the, the you know, the ten test to get in, the written test, passed the physical, and then they uh, took me to Fort Hamilton with my brother. And my brother goes, yo, I used to hang out here. A few blocks from here, they sell dust. Shit. Guess what we did? We went and bought five bags of dust and got dusted out of our fucking minds. <laughs> I'd never even been on a fucking airplane. And they put us on a fucking airplane, a military hop flight to go to Great Lakes. While you were high up your ass. High on dust, bugging the fuck out. And they bring you in there at night to disorient you. It's a mental thing. They bring you into boot camp in the middle of the fucking night so that you don't know where you are. And you're out. Great Lakes is outside of Chicago in the boonies. Okay. And it was January. It's like Freezing. 36 below zero. Fuck. Fuck that. And then I just crashed out, and I did the best I could in boot camp, and then shipped out to Norfolk to my duty station, and there happened to be a punk rock club in in town, the That's Taj in Mahal, Norfolk, Norfolk, Virginia. Yeah. And I started going to the shows there. You're 18 at this point. Yeah. You have to be 18 to go to the Navy, right? Uh, seven, 17. You could sign in at 16 with your parents signing you in. Interesting. And then you could you Still? have to wait till you're 17. Yeah. I believe I don't I don't yeah. know, but this was back in 1980. So the thing was, I started going to all the punk rock shows, and then I started. I got an apartment off base, and I started a drug business. I was selling drugs, so I was smuggling shit on my ship, pills, weed, selling coke, to other people in the navy, selling to locals, selling to whoever. Nah, I didn't sell on the base. Ever, because then you're fucked. Yeah, I'm sure. So, I was at a gig at the King's Head Inn on Hampton Boulevard. Forget who. I think I went to see 999 or something. And this dude set me up. And I sold coat to undercovers. Fuck. And they busted me. And I, I had previously met the Bad Brains. That's was... Like I met Henry Rollins, Henry Ian, Rollins a cool Ian Mackay. Oh, uh, he's he's dope. Ian Mackay, all the motherfuckers in 1980, the spring of '80, that they, they came down to play the Taj Mahal. The yeah, here at that point, probably right. The Teen Idols and the Untouchables, and Henry and all them came, and then I started going to all the gigs up in Washington D.C. So I met the Bad Brains in Norfolk, then seen him in D.C. So it's a new genre at that point too. It must have been super everybody exciting. Everybody was fucking bugging on us, dude. And every weekend in DC, it was either we were fighting rednecks, jocks, or marines. <laughs> and we had crazy motherfuckers, crazy motherfuckers that were down with us that would just fight anybody. Those punk rock clubs were fucking nuts. Yeah, you had the nine thirty club, you had fucking all these all these different venues. And, and fighting's like built into the culture of that scene. Well, not really. We didn't really everything. fight with each other. You didn't, like, now rednecks have mohawks, but back in 1980, it wasn't like that. Yeah. You were the outsiders. The greasers and, versus the socialists type of deal. Yeah, so it was just, like, just fighting and going to shows. And, but you're still not making music at this point. No, and that happened because when I caught that case, they restricted me to my ship. 
awaiting trial. It was a civilian case, right? If I would have sold on the base, it would have been a different story. They would have put me in Leavenworth. But they didn't kick you out of the Navy automatically? No. That's cool. Because I said, I, I pleaded not guilty. I said, nah, that was this dude shit. He told me to just hand it, you know, me, blah, 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 whatever the fuck. Mm -hmm. I lied. So I was awaiting trial, but they restricted me to my ship in the meantime. They busted me to an E1. They took my pay. Damn. I was restricted to the ship. Couldn't go on. So the ship, right before we left Norfolk, like it's wild when you look at all the steps of how shit happened. Like how if one little piece of that puzzle was different. Butterfly effect. So they pulled two of my wisdom teeth before I left on the ship. So then the ship goes to like Roosevelt Roads, Bermuda, and we're heading down past the equator down to like Argentina and the, the fucking tip of South America. It's called shellback when you cross the equator. And there was this one redneck on my ship that just kept fucking with me and fucking with me, man. And he'd just be like, you fucking New York faggot <laughs> motherfucker, punk rock faggot and all this shit. I'm like, dude, like people in them days just showed up in the military because they didn't have nothing else going on. I was like, it was a choice between this or prison for me. So yeah. I came from a different, and the dude didn't know because he thought he was bigger than me that he put fear in my heart. But he had that, no idea. <laughs> I was like, bro, stop fucking with me, man. He's like, I'll fuck you up, man. You just fucking talk a lot of shit, faggot. And just kept faggot this, faggot that. So I started getting an infection from my teeth. So Which I was is brutal. I was a boatswain mate, right? So I had to watch all these motherfuckers go on leave in Bermuda and, and Antigua and all this shit. And I couldn't go off the ship. So one day I was working what's called the deck grinder and it take we had a helo on our ship and it takes up the non skid and then you paint the red lead, which was the primer and then you paint the so I was for it to land? Well, it's the non skid on the deck, you okay. know. But it was on the helo deck. And aft was a I was on a CGN. So like I'm there with this deck grinder, it's hot out, it's fucking tropical hot, I'm dying, I'm not getting paid, I gotta do all this work. And he walks by me and kicks the fucking primer can over and it goes on my shoes and my pants. And he goes, fucking faggot, pick it up. Because I got busted to E1 and he had a crow. He was a third class petty officer. So he had he had military pull over me. Like we had penitentiary pull. Yeah, he had he had rank over me. Something just snapped. I went to the boats and locker and he was in there and he was like, you know, getting ready to mix paint, whatever the fuck. And I just went in and I dogged down the hatch, which meant I closed two of the fucking latches and I picked up a paint can and I beat that motherfucker till he shit his pants and then I stomped him. And I left him in there bloodied and unconscious. And I went to my rack and I just laid there and waited for the master at arms. Hour later, psh, pulled my curtain open. Get the fuck, get on the floor, get on the deck. Fuck put the cuffs on me, restricted me on the ship, locked me down. So now you're stuck, stuck, on, a, so stuck now, on a room, stuck on a ship. So. The infection got so bad, they took me to sick bay. They're like, this this guy needs to get medevaced off this ship. Wow. So the helo came out, picked, landed on the helo deck, and took me back to Roosevelt Roads. This was 1980, before the computers. They forgot to tell them that I was supposed to be a prisoner locked to the fucking bed, to the bed. So... After the infection cleared, they put me on a drip and all that. They gave me my ID and a ch they paid me. And I was running around Puerto Rico going fucking crazy. Getting in bar fights in the jungle, fucking tripping my balls off, doing whatever the fuck I wanted. What do you trip on down there? Acid. Nice. There was an ex-Navy guy who had a tattoo shop out in the middle of the jungle. Did they, did they drug test you back then in the uh, Navy? No, there was no drug testing yet. Wow. I was a garbage pair. I so was, everybody must have been getting fucked everybody up. Everybody was fucking smoking weed, 
My first class caught me smoking. I went up to the 06 level. On the boat. As soon as the deck is called the main level, then 01, 02, I climbed up all the way into the fucking tower. To smoke a joint. And, I, and he knew it. <laughs> and this guy was a bad motherfucker because I trained in martial arts with him. So when you went, his name was BM1 Baldwin. And when you went to second, uh, the third phase of Buds to become a SEAL, he taught the hand-to-hand -hand combat people yeah, so to the real SEALs. Dude. He was the real deal. Yeah. And he was Naval Investigative Service. He came to my ship because some people tried to kill him that he caught them smuggling drugs at his last command and he fucking killed one of them throwing, like, they literally tried to kill him. So he was a bad motherfucker. But he liked me and he caught me and he was like, he just had a powwow with me and he was like, I'm gonna let this slide but the next time, you're, you're fucked. going, you're fucked. So I, I was kind of cool with him but the thing was, like, there was nothing that could happen. Like, when they medevac me off that ship back to Roosevelt Roads, and then they were like, your ship doesn't want, they said, we can't reach your ship, so you got to go back to Norfolk to TPU, the Transient Personnel Unit, and wait for your ship to come back. So they sent me back to Norfolk again, and I was just running wild, hanging with the bad brains. And then the first class was like, yo, your ship's coming in tomorrow. Like, wink, wink. Like, they finally reached uh, like, get the fuck out of Nimitz here. Hall and said, yo, hold this guy. Mm. We're coming to get him tomorrow. And I fucking got off the fucking base the next morning and went and I stayed with Henry Rollins and Ian Mackay had an apartment uh, right outside of Georgetown. And then DC. I went up to the... And that's how the music started because when I went... Hang out with them. Well, when I went back to New York, I caught a ride with this band called The Undead. And I got out of the van and I ran into the Bad Brains. They had moved up to 171 Avenue A studio. And then they let me stay there and we started rehearsing with the Crow Mags. You always wanted to make music and this was kind of the opportunity? Yeah, I just was like... Did you ever sing at all or anything like that? Like, how did you... Yeah, in the shower. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking punk rock ain't singing. That yeah. shit is like... But, uh, but still, you had to have a certain yeah, voice Yeah, you had for to it. have talent and stage presence and the whole shit. But it was just the natural. It came in for you easily. We never played with the Crow Mags. The band broke up. But then we went, I got to go on tour with the Bad Brains after they made that first record. I was living at the studio there. This is the they, 80s now. This is 81. So we went out on the road and the roadies formed a band called Blood Clot. And we opened up for the Bad Brains every night. And that's when the music shit started. And you fell in love with that immediately, I presume. <sighs> Fucking unbelievable energy, man. Yeah. So now at this point, so you're, at how old at this point? 1920? Uh, yeah. I'm uh, well, this was 81, so I'm like 19, 20, yeah. I got to think that at that point, being, I mean, to correct me if I'm wrong, probably pretty lost in life, right? You, oh, I, you're I had around. federal warrants yeah, for so my you're, arrest. You're lost at this point. That but, music must have felt but like I a savior. But i tell you what the thing was. I was still using drugs. So there was a very dangerous Puerto Rican gang who ran a drug spot on 11th Street that was the number one, the biggest drug spot in the United States for wow. heroin and cocaine. So they had that whole block, and then they had a deli on the corner of 11th and A. Next to that deli was 171 Studio, and they started having gigs. And the Puerto Rican gang did not want all these punk rockers hanging out there. So it was the Bad Brains were playing, and uh, there was about 50 punk rockers there, the Beastie Boys, wow. all of that, like everybody's hanging out. So this gang comes in the studio and starts fucking smacking people and pulling knives. And I said to the late J. Dubley, who was the Bad Brains producer and owned the studio, I said, yo, let's get these motherfuckers. Like, why ain't nobody fighting back? There's 50. And he said, don't fuck with them. They kill people. They're like a drug gang. And then the one dude, Crazy Eddie, tried to like stab me in the stomach. And I like got out of the way. And the bad brains were playing. And I was like, yo, if you do that again, I'm gonna fuck, I'm gonna fuck you up. And then 
they shut the gig down. Everybody went outside and they're smacking people, like, cause they didn't want crowds hanging out Blowing around their, their drug spot. Yeah. And then the dude just walked up to me and tried to stab me in the stomach, and I just blocked it. I hit him with a fucking bop bop, like a two piece. Took him to the ground, smashed his head off the curb, knocked him out, and then it was like three or four of his homies came at me with knives, and I, I used to wear a chain. That was the weapon with a quick release, big bike chain, like them heavy chains. Yeah. I just took that shit off and, and then got in a fucking fight with these motherfuckers, like trying to stab me. I ended up getting stabbed, and I got away, and then they put a KOS on me, kill yeah. on sight. Yeah. So I didn't go, I wasn't able to go to Avon. Nobody would hang out with me <laughs> yeah. except for that crazy Russian punk rock motherfucker, James Contra. Everybody else was terrified. They were like, don't hang out with him. We don't want to get hit they while were looking with at, They were looking for me with guns. Yeah. Like, and then uh, I just went down and faced them one night. And uh, right when they was getting ready to drag me off, fucking two of the bad brains came out of the studio, Doc and Daryl. And they're like, yo, 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 chill, chill. And because they was black, the fucking, that gang was like, yo. Like, they kind of had this talk. And they was like, yo, we, you, you, you guys came in here fucking with everybody. He was just standing up for himself. You tried to stab him. And then it got to be this thing. And then the main guy was like, yo, out of all them motherfuckers, you're the only one with heart. And they gave me a fucking pass on that shit. Wow. Those two guys probably saved your life. They did save my life. Doc, the guitar player, and Daryl, the bass player. And if anybody don't believe that shit, you go on the Bad Brains page and you say, yo, John <laughs> Joseph's telling this, and they'll tell you fucking 100% what the fuck went down. And the thing is, then... That's when I got the security job and I set up the drums for the drummer Earl. I was his drum tech and security. Cause I didn't give a fuck. I would fight anybody. It, it, I never started no shit, but that's how the, the rules of the street was. Don't start none, there won't be none. And then I got to be real good friends with Eddie cause he was locked up. I was like, yeah, you know, fucking, like I knew the lingo. Yeah. You know, I was like, I had that penitentiary pull, fucking this, that, the other thing, you know, like just shooting the shit. And you ended up being close. You ended up being yeah, cool. Yeah, I was friends with him. The last time I seen him was maybe 15 years ago. And he's like, yo, what's up? But he's dead now, I heard. Yeah. But he, he's lived in but the city, too. But he's been in and out of prison. But, like, that's how I went on the road with them. And I got to be there. And HR was like. This is the, the bad brains. Yeah, and I tried to be a drummer. HR's like, you got too much energy. I think he was just being nice because I couldn't keep the beat to save my life. <laughs> He's like, you got too much energy. You need to be a singer. Yeah. And like, they was all into ITAL, plant-based, and fucking like working out and the whole shit. At this and point, you're still into drugs? anybody doesn't know who the Bad Brains are, put in Bad Brains full set 1982 CBGBs, and you're going to see why everybody is like this when you talk about the Bad Brains. Nobody could ever fuck with them live. And I saw Led Zeppelin. I saw Sabbath. I saw Yes. I saw The Who. I saw The, I saw the Stones. I saw all those bands in the 70s because one of my gigs was selling beat acid at all the concerts <laughs> with this junkie dude. So, like, we would sell fake acid, get real acid, and then get tickets and go in and see all the shows. I, none of them could fuck with the Bad Brains, what I saw the Bad Brains do. That's the energy that these motherfuckers had. And it was on some next spiritual shit. And everybody around them was like into yoga and meditation and like crazy shit. Martial arts, they got me a job at a health food store. I started going to yoga in 81. But were you in? Were you still doing drugs at this point? No, because they were like, you can't do no drugs wow. and you can't drink. So not only did they save your fucking life. And you life, can't eat meat. So they saved your life, for like literally in a sense, you know, taking you from getting dragged away, probably yeah. shot. But then they completely changed uh, the way you live. They was gonna kill my ass. And then they changed the way you live changed after that. Changed my life completely. That one month I went on the road with them, I came back a new person. I never looked back. Crazy. And then I just kept reading books on philosophy and all this shit. 
And then I got a job at a health food store with this cat, Vinny Signorelli, who played in the Unsane as a re he's a tattoo artist now, but he worked, he managed a health food store and he started taking me to the Krishna temple for the morning programs of meditation in the morning. And I was like, wow. Change your life. And then I, I went to live as a monk for two years. I was a Hare Krishna monk with the shaved head and everything. You took off from music for that time? Yeah. And where was that? I went to Hawaii. Holy shit. For a year. And I had boats and mate skills, so they they. Hold on, I'm sorry, I don't want to cut you off, but so you were. I'm just trying to follow the timeline. So you got in with the bad brains, went on the road with them. Yeah. Then you took two years off to be a monk. Right. So when I came back, it was kind of weird. Wait, how was the being a monk? I, I, I I'm gonna break into that <laughs> in a minute, but here's the thing. The bad brains started getting in with these motherfuckers, and I hated this dude because his his name was uh, Judah. Al Freeba, but I called him Judas because that's what he was. Backstabber. He's a Rasta dude, but he was into Farrakhan and all this bullshit. And he started saying white people's the devils and all this bullshit. shit. So he got everybody that was white fired off the fucking crew. Hmm. And Including I you. was already going to the temple, but I was. It broke my heart because HR was my, like my brother. He was like my big brother. And then. I had all my shit packed, and we were supposed to go to California. It was the night before we were supposed to leave for the tour. And I said to Earl, yo, ah, oh, man, this is going to be so much fun. And he's like, yo, squids, that's what they call me, because when they met me, I was in the Navy, so they call you a squid. Yeah. They're like, yo, squids. Bad news. I got bad news, man. You're not going. And I was like, what? He's like, yo, you can't go because you cited up other run-ins. I was like, what are you talking about? Oh, all that Krishna stuff and like, and they this guy just got all like, got them to like they 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 went on tour, but then as time progressed, they they got them to stop playing punk rock music and all this shit and like, just got fuck, in their heads. fuck the bad brains up, man, for a little bit. The singer, so that fucked me up when they went on the road without me. Like, after everything that I did, like, I put my life on the line. We yeah. went down south on that tour. We had to fucking have standoffs against bikers, like, calling them, you know. Yeah. I'm going to say it. Niggas with funny hair and all that shit. At the, like, just crazy shit. They were talking shit to the people you were with. With the bad brains. Yeah, because they were black punk rock, which was probably A very strange back then. black punk rock in the south? Yeah. Are you fucking kidding me? So you guys dealt with probably a ton they of racism. They got fucking t racism like you wouldn't believe. Yeah. Plug pulled, thrown out of the club when they saw what the bad brains were doing live. Fucking, yo, and I had to like be like, that's they're the like that's... fucking risking my life. It's like, like 80s yo, down I south will kill these... Is... This is 81, bro. Yeah, this is next level. This is not like When we bad hit tweets. North Carolina, the Big Bad Wolf in Raleigh, it was a biker bar. That's where all the shit I started realizing. D.C. was cool. As soon as you got below D.C. Confederate flags and shit, probably. That's right. Yeah, fucking that. Using the N-word, calling a, like, yeah. just... You know, we went to the Big Bad Wolf. We walked in there like, what the fuck y'all niggas want? Like, these biker dudes. I'm like, What? I was like, yo, and Doc, they're like, yo, we're the band. They're like, y'all motherfuckers ain't the band. The Bad Brains is the band. We are the Bad Brains, the, idiots. The, the manager sent out the promo tour posters without pictures of the Bad Brains on it. <laughs> Nobody knew they were black. Oh, shit, it's like the Dave Chappelle skit. Dude, I'm fucking telling you, man. And then, like, they're like, you motherfuckers ain't the Bad Brains. And, and then Doc holds up his guitar fucking case with a Bad Brains sticker and he turns to the dude and goes, the band is niggers type shit. And then we was just going to go at it right there. And HR was like, no. That motherfucker it was militant. And you want to talk about internal power? What he said goes, huh? He said, we're going to get this shit done later. He comes out on stage he and he goes, wreck this Babylon fucking racist club. And then... The 150 punk rockers that were there, we had the whole fucking, the, just rock that place, tore it up. And a couple of the bouncers got beat down. And then at the end, the doors fly open. And the owner walks in with like four bikers with baseball bats. And goes, where's that nigger lead singer that wrecked my club? 
And that's when I just started handing out pieces of drum hardware, cymbal stands. I'm like, I just walked out. I was like, come on, motherfuckers. Like, let's they go. thought we was going to bitch up. Nah. I'm like, nah, motherfuckers. I said, let's go. Let's dance, bitch. <laughs> come on, motherfuckers. Shit. And then, like, they were like, they backed down and called the cops, and they took us to the fucking highway, said never. And then it just kept going on from there. Florida, everything. Getting robbed. Like not getting paid, getting the plug pulled. It was it just fucked me up to be like thinking I'm family, and then and I realized it wasn't him. They just had bad influence because we're friends. Someone even, in their ear. We're friends to this day, man. And 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 the thing was, so I went to Hawaii because the Krishna's had a magazine called Back to Godhead. And on the cover was a sailboat, and it said they were looking for somebody to work on the boat that has deck skills and all this shit. And I called up. I said, yo, I was a boats mate. I know the whole shit, navigation, everything. And they're like, well, come on out. And I went out there, and I was a monk for a year out there. Shaved your head the whole night? Everything, man. They'd be dressed like a Tibetan style? Yeah, man, wow. with the robes. and then Quiet like, all day So everything. every day I got up 2 a.m. I did my whole morning program. I practiced in martial arts. This one guy in the temple. What kind of martial arts was like, it? Like uh, karate shit. Okay. You know? And yeah. he was fucking dope, this black Hare Krishna dude. And... uh and then like, and then I would go out and try to give out books and all. It, it was they had some scams going that I got. I talk about it in my book. But then I went back to I left, and I went back to New York. And then I moved into the temple in New York. And I spent another year there. And then I just still a monk in New York. Yeah. And, and then how'd I, you get back to music and tie up with the chrome and all that's that? That's what happened. See, I was. I was going down to the park, and we was feeding people at Tompkins Square Park. This was 83. Okay. And then it's funny because KRS-One talks about how he got his name because the Hare Krishnas would come to the shelter and feed everybody and give out the books. That was me. Wow. Because we would feed at Tompkins Square Park and then go over to the shelter on 3rd Street between 2nd between, uh, and 3rd. Okay. And then feed the rest of the food and give out the books. But the thing was, I would run into the dude from the Crow Mags, and he'd be like, yo, we got the band back together. Fuck this Krishna shit, man. Come on. And I was like, nah, man, this is my life. I organized this concert called Rock Against Maya. There was like 5,000 people in Tompkins Square Park. We fed everybody. But I started getting more and more missing the music. And this crazy shit was going on in the temple. I started hearing all this crazy shit that was going down. Like, they were molesting kids and stealing money Fuck. and murdered people that spoke out against the hierarchy. Like, crazy shit. And then I, when I found that out, I was like, yo, I'm out. And you can't just walk out the front door because I was a big money collector. I was collecting $3,000 a week for them. And thinking it's going to feed people and print books and do, and they were just putting it. it in bank accounts, fucking god, and selling drugs and fucking steroids and guns and crazy shit. It's like every power structure somehow becomes corrupted oh, eventually. Yeah. So even, I split, and then I temple. went and, and I showed up at this burnt out building where everybody was hanging out, seven thirteen East Ninth between C and D, and then uh, right in East Village. Well, Alphabet City, we didn't. Okay, that's, yeah. That's a lot different. Like, well, even at Tompkins, even at Tompkins Park was really rough back oh, in the day. Oh, are you kidding me? That was like, A7 was a club across the street on 7th and A. They had a sign in there for the bands on the door that said, out of town bands, remember where you are. Do not go in that park across the street. That's funny. Cause even I hang out that T-spot where I saw you at on yeah. 10th Street, Kabasucha, between, uh, it's 1st and A. Yeah. And, uh, I told my pops where I was. He's like, I'm like, over by that park. I was trying to tell him where it was. He's like, Tom, he's like, what the fuck are you doing over here? He's like, don't go in that place. The place is, you know, they'll fucking try to yeah. rob you in there. I mean, it's not like that anymore. Well, it's like, it's old people it, with their it, dogs it, now and it, shit. It, it was built on top of an Indian burial ground. Yeah, and so, supposedly they found, like, traces of, like, long thought forgotten diseases and shit. And they excavated well, it. When they had Tent City in there and like they Thai knocked it in down there. in 88. They found fucking hepatitis in the soil. Yeah. They had built a fucking shanty town in the middle of that. The shit was crazy. I do walking tours now where it's like I take people around and it's like crime, art, and music. And like people can't believe this that shit. That area, yeah. Forget it. 
I don't want to let the cat out of the bag, but uh, I'm, I can't give specifics, but I just got hired, and uh, I'm going to be writing a TV show about that neighborhood in the early 80s and the crime. That's and, dope. And, and it's going to be the real shit, because the dude who is, who is the producer is a real motherfucker. Like, and... So yeah, that's going down. Let me soon. know when that comes out. I'd love to see yeah, it. Yeah, well, it, it's in the early stages. We didn't even write the pilot yet, but we're that's cool. He's involved with another TV show right now. So like when that fa when that gets done, you know, he just wrote me like a couple months ago and was like, "Yo, get ready. We, I just have I'm having a meeting in February, and then blah 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 blah." Production takes a long time. Though, so yeah, I'm sure. well, you know, yeah, but you Especially know, these times. like that's what I do now. I'm a writer. Like I'm adapting my book, my memoir to film. I'm gonna write an I'm gonna writing an indie movie. film. Well, I I just base it on that one year right now that um, my first year on the streets, '77, and all the. Like my first girlfriend died of a heroin overdose. She, she uh, was doing dope and got clean, and then the you dude, need to make a Netflix series then, out of this. Then the dude that I sold heroin for got her hooked on junk again and started fucking her behind my back while they were doing dope, and then they just split. And then somebody was like, "Yo, your girl is dead in a bungalow on 116th Street." Fuck, and like, and yeah, I looked too much for that for motherfucker movie. for so long, and I never found him. And then like, I ran into him years later after lockup and being on the streets, and like in the eighties, and I never forget his voice. And he was like, "Yo, I got hash. What do you need?" And he always used to sell fake drugs. And this was in Washington Square Park. And I was like, I know that fucking voice. And I turn around, and it was this dude, Mike Debris. And he, I was like, I hadn't seen him since he did that shit. But he did time in jail and all this shit. And he was like, yo, I have AIDS. I got this new disease called AIDS. Back then, you're probably thinking, like, I can get it from touching him. Scabs and, like, yeah. And he was, like, going to die and died. But like, you know, it's life is crazy, man. That's why, you know, these days I I try to live that shit to the fullest and do, you know, I even like all the years in the crow mags and then like, you know, I was living in the burnt out building when I left the, the ashram, the temple. No running water, no lights, no uh, like garbage bags over the windows taking fire hydrant showers in the middle of the winter, getting on my bike to be a bike messenger for fucking eight to 10 hours through the streets of New York to pay for cro rehearsals. This is how you guys started together. Yeah. And the dude, I'm going to say his name, Harley was supposed to be my boy. And we built up this whole fucking band going on the road, like Motorhead taking us out, Megadeth, Metallica coming to see us and getting in the mosh pit, James Headfield. Saw us at Lamore. And we were, you know, one for all for one, one for all, like fucking, especially me and him. And then I go, he started getting weird because, like, as the band got more famous, I'm the fucking singer of the band. So they were asking kind of me the for the interviews and all. And he just got envious. And then we went to Europe. What years is this run with the Chromex? This Chrome is a, the, like the end of 83. That, when I left, they had another singer that they got while I was in the t temple. But they fired him because he couldn't even fucking sing on stage live. He was sitting down, and he th they did two shows at CBGB's. I was there for both of them. But then when I came to the band, they started getting this rep for being skinhead assholes. This Harley was on the cover of this, like, gay magazine because he was, like, bashing gay people down. And, like, it started getting this, like, white supremacist a bad rep. Like, fucking skinhead rep. Like, dude had a swat sticker tattoo. Just like... And I'm like, yo, if I'm coming back to this band, this is what I just went through for two years, we're going to make this shit. We're going to put fucking the highest philosophy on the planet into the street culture. And that's what we did. That's the lyrics that I that's sang. That's 83 that started. This is end of 83. 84, we started... 
we recorded a demo, we fucking started playing out, and that's when the shit just started taking the fuck off. We were like, you guys have to see the Crow Mags. Like, everybody was coming to see us. And you were traveling the world now. Traveling. You said Europe. Traveling everywhere. 88, uh, 87, we, we, we were going to play with Black Sabbath and Motorhead in Europe and Paris. Wow, and that's tour. a five-year run. Yeah, but the thing was, no, it's uh, the end of 83, started gigging in 84, and I had to, I was a fugitive, so I had to like do what I had to do to get to, you know, do whatever. And you were touring the whole time with Warrants. On Warrants, <laughs> on MTV, like the whole it's shit. It's fucking crazy. But the thing was, we go to Europe, and the last show of the tour, Harley steals all the goddamn tour money. He He's wrestling with the manager and finds the wallet with the junky guitar player, Doug, and they're in the bathroom, and the, and the drummer was on the toilet, and they didn't know. They went in, they're like, yo, we got the tour money. Doug's like, we should give it back. That's all the band. And Harley was like, fuck those motherfuckers. I'm going on vacation. I need the money. And then, like, um, they, they fucking, they took the money. And then Petey Hines, the drummer, he's now a chef, no one was on the toilet. I would have heard this whole he thing. He was like, dude, I heard the whole shit, bro. And that's when I was like, we already having problems with the manager. Profile Records was robbing us. They robbed everybody. Run DMC, Smooth the Hustle, a Special Ed. They robbed Motorhead for millions of dollars. And they never paid us a single fucking dime. So I already had problems with the manager. Yeah, but now this is it. This so is... now my own fucking best friend who I came up. And let me tell you something. I had to protect that motherfucker on the streets. He goes and writes books about how tough he is and all. That motherfucker, if it wasn't for me, motherfuckers wanted to kill his ass. And they came up to me, the same Puerto Ricans that were contract murderers came up to me, the guy I fought, and goes, yo, this dude's in your band, right? And had the gay magazine news cover. It was him, like, with a fucking chain getting ready to wreck some gay dudes, and they got a picture, and I was like, yeah, why, what's up? And he's like, they paid us to do this motherfucker, but here's the deal, I didn't take the contract because of you. So you tell him to chill the fuck out because he's bringing heat to the neighborhood now. We got detectives coming around. Why, they were getting, they were they beating were up fucking, on the street, beating up gay people, They were whatever. beating up gay people like fucking crazy, bro. That area's very like, like felonious assaults, yeah. like bad. Yeah. For no reason, For just no fucking hate crimes. reason, hate crimes. Hate crimes. Yeah, fucked up. But the thing was, when I told Harley that shit, that motherfucker took off all his skinhead clothes, grew his hair out, and put sneakers on. And was like, yo. I was like, dude, they're going to kill you, man. And I protected that motherfucker on the streets. We did so much shit together and were boys. Fucking gave that motherfucker let my last dime in my pocket or last bit of food everything i had i split with that dude and took his back he was like my little brother and then for him to do that shit to me on that tour yeah ultimate betrayal. i fucking i had to go back on christmas in the states and get evicted from my and i was homeless you had no money i had no money fucking so God. like that was the thing and then i quit the fucking band and that's 88 that's yeah this is early 88 and then he comes back he's like yo man and just walked up on me, and I fucking, I just fucking bitch slapped that motherfucker so hard. Like, I love those open palm strikes to the <laughs> yeah. ear. You fucking motherfucker's yeah, equilibrium. Up, and then up. he had a pit bull try to come at me. I just took the dog. He had a halter. I just threw that motherfucker in the street. I was like, how the fuck could you do that shit to me? So he begged me to sing on Best Wishes, which I had been performing the songs. And I was like, nah, I'm done. He's like, well, can I use your lyrics? I said, yeah, just give me credit, and which he didn't. And then he said, please don't tell the press that you quit because I, I robbed the band because I won't be able to go on. It's, so I go, all right, man, I'm going to fucking tell him I had beef with the manager. They go out on the tour, and he says, oh, yeah, he sucked as a singer, and he was a drug addict, and that's why we got rid of him because... After that, from 88 to 90, I relapsed into fucking 
freebase and crack cocaine and pills and i had a two-year relapse of crazy shit i think that happened because of kind of losing your I hit spot rock bottom. Yeah. i had nothing everything i worked no for direction. was taken from me no music no nothing yeah. and then the first time i freebased in miami the guy i was freebasing with it was his house he had stolen two kilos of coke from the cocaine cowboy motherfuckers down there and he leaves and it's like, oh, yeah, you guys could fucking stay. I stayed in his room and we were up for two days free basing. And I'm about to pass out. I hear this car pull up outside at like sunrise. I hear the door open. I hear two bolts on AR-15s. And then they did a walk around into his fucking room where I was. <laughs> Just fucking shooting up the whole fucking house, bro. Looking for him. Empty two clips. Not oh. looking to kill his ass. And I rolled off the waterbed. It exploded. All his... And then the cops came and were like, this is drug-related. Where's the drugs? I was like, this ain't no, you know, whatever. Like, this, I don't even live here. I'm from New York. I have fake ID, whatever. No warrants came up. And so that, that started the whole crazy... Shit. And you went back to New York and just kept getting high. Yeah, went back to New York and then you, started robbing crack dealers and fucking had more fucking contracts out on me. Like, they were like, yo, we're going to kill that white boy looking surfer motherfucker when we catch his ass. And like, were you still doing music at this point? Or not no, really? nothing, dude. Wow. Two years, I fell the fuck off. So they knew that. So he used that against me to say, yeah, he's a drug addict. That's why we kicked him out of the band and he couldn't drugs. sing and all this shit. Yeah. And then I ran into him in the middle of the fucking Central Park in the meadow and he was with all these little skinhead dudes and I was with these two black dudes who trained in martial arts. This was like right about the time when I started getting clean again. Was it and I was like, yo, take Late, late 1889, whatever. And, and, and um, I still was dabbling, though. And then uh, I, he came up to me. I go, yo, motherfucker, I let you use my shit, and then you dog me in the press? I fucking cracked him. He goes, that's it. I'm getting a fucking order of protection. First, all the skinheads he was with jumped up. And the two brothers I was with, I was like, they were bad motherfuckers. I was like, I was like, you motherfuckers want some too? And then they all backed down. And then he walked out of the meadow like, that's it, motherfucker. I'm going to the cops. I'm getting the order of protection against you, this, that. Like, this is a tough guy from the streets, right? Supposedly. Anyway, push comes to shove. I got clean. All this crazy shit happened on the West Coast with the drugs. Come back to New York. I hit rock bottom. What was your final moment? Like, what I'm going to tell you? you right now, I was with this really wealthy girl, and we did this whole Bonnie and Crackhead Clyde shit. <laughs> <laughs> like, her stepfather <laughs> was so powerful in Hollywood. He, he did the whole uh, Ronald Reagan inaugural ceremony in 84. He, he was in with, like, George Slaughter, all these big motherfuckers, and, like, she was loaded like a model and shit, and then like we just fucking went off the rails, dude. Sold everything, started like putting all kinds of shit on her credit cards to, to trade dealers, and yeah. sold the car. Like we started the first when I flew out here to be with her, cause she's like, get out of New York, cause I robbed this, these, this Colombian, and threw him out of my car at like 50 miles an hour. And they knew who the fuck we was, and they was looking for me. She's like, get out of New it's York. It's a good time to get out of town. I got on a flight to L.A. So when I got out there, we went to her house in Santa Monica on Pacific Coast Highway. And it's a mansion. It's her parents' house. And they were doing a Playboy shoot at the mansion. Like just, cur I'm like, what the fuck? It was like... Like, from this is everything I ever dreamed about California, <laughs> man. Hot from a, chicks from in a the burnt pool. out building to a fucking, fucking mansion in the water. Unbelievable. Yeah. She picked me up in a convertible fucking, like, Porsche at the airport. Like, fucking hot blonde with the glasses. And she's like, 
you know, the first thing she said was like, because we dated a little bit in New York, she's like, you look like shit. I was like, thanks, <laughs> nice to see you too. <laughs> and she's like, I know you, she was sending me packages of Coke, like half ounces, and like I was freebasing it all. And she's like, I know you were smoking that shit. You can't do that here. And you we have to get a job. In California. So I got a job as a roofer, and I'm like, coming off detox, trying to do roofing in, in houses and shit, like carrying degrees. up tar rolls and hot tar motherfuckers. And yeah. like, I was like, after like three days, I'm like, get the fuck, fuck out of here. And then like, we just went on a tear and her parents hired FBI to find us like, dude, crazy shit. Like the Red Hot Chili Peppers merch girl, which I still owe her money if you're listening to this. I got you. Her name was Lisa. She kind of liked me, whatever, because she knew me from cro But she let us stay at the house, and she was a drug dealer. So when she went to work, we, my girl was jealous. She's like, she wants to fuck you. And I was like, no, she doesn't. She's like, yeah, she does. So then, like, like the third morning, she comes out with a bag of cash and all this crystal speed. And I was like, yo, what the fuck are you doing? And she's like, we're taking this, let's go. And I was like, we, yo, I'm not rob. She And she's like, that's because you want to fuck her. And it's all right that I robbed my whole family for hundreds and thousands of dollars, which she did. Yeah. It was like 170 grand we spent. She's like, I'm taking this. You either come with me or you could stay here with your bitch. And I split. All right, let's go. And then like we went. And went up to Frisco, and then, like, we had everybody in L.A. after us. We had the cops, and we had all these, like, tough motherfuckers that knew her after me, too. So now you're up in Frisco on a bender. So Pisco, Frisco, and we're trying to, like, figure out how the fuck we can get out of the whole shit. And then this is a scene right out of a movie. We go to this, like— This? Not the last hour? This this car dealership (laughs) to sell her car. Back in L.A. to get out of L.A. Yeah. And then, like, it was this, like, typical used car sales motherfucker, fat motherfucker, like, and and then we go in there, and he's looking at us, and we're, like, we're, like, strung the fuck out on yeah. pills, and, like, he's, like, I just got to, you know, check the title and this and that. And then, like, she, he's, like, waiting in the lobby. I was, like, something's up. And she was like, you always think you know what's up. Just fucking shut up. Like, we were arguing yeah, like that. but you that. know when it, when it was like, something's I just saw, off. Yo, my spider senses was yeah. tingly. I go to the back, and he's like, yes, Mrs. So-and-so. I got them here. I'm going to stall them. Like, and I'm I'm, I'm, I'm already uh, called the police, this and that. I go, I go back. I'm like, yo, this motherfucker called the cops. So he was arguing to give us five thousand. We wanted like eight, whatever, nine, whatever it was. He comes out and he's like, oh, I called my business partner. We've decided to give you the eight or nine thousand dollars. So just we're doing the paperwork. Wait here. And then he goes back, and I'm like, yo, he called. Um, he was on the fucking phone with your mother. She's like, bullshit. We're arguing. I go to the back. He's sitting in the desk, and the title's right on the desk. I look at it. He looks at it, and he goes to grab it. Boom! I smash him, picked up the paperweight, mashed him in the head, grabbed (laughs) the title, ran out. Just as we ran out, her mother pulls up with fucking three cop cars, and we got away up into the, we drove on up foot? into the uh, hills in her car in in uh in in the Hollywood Hills and we got away and then then we were like we got to get rid of this car so then she calls up her friend this is how the whole shit ended on my drug run for 2 years that owns a dealership in Palm Springs she's like I used to go to school with this guy now he's like really wealthy fucking whatever I was like, all right, let's go out there. I'm driving. I'm doing 100 miles an hour, and we get pulled over. I got no license. I got warrants. High, probably. The fucking state trooper comes up, older guy, 
And I was like, that's it. I'm done. I'm, I'm going away now. And fucking, uh, I roll down the window. He goes, license and registration. And I'm like, do I drag this motherfucker in? Like, you're thinking like the craziest shit. You're all strung out. You're not thinking right. How and I I'm violent. I was working out like crazy. Like, like, do I drag this motherfucker in the car, bang him and, and drive off? What do I do? And he's like, license and registration. Put your hands, put your hands on, you know, for, he says, I wouldn't do it. He goes, put your hands on the wheel. Put your, where I can see him. And then he's got his, he's leaning on the window. And then I see he's got a boats and mate tattoo with his ship, DD something, another shell back. I was like, so when did you cross the equator, Boats? And he was like, you a Navy man? <laughs> and then I swear to my mother. You guys are best friends now. I started talking Navy shit with him about beating the polywogs down. I didn't cross the equator, but I knew the terminology because yeah. we started learning what's going to happen when we cross the... He's like, oh, man, I can't give no Navy man a ticket. Listen, keep it under 70 out here. The next trooper's going to... Wow. Know, and we drove off. Now, dig this. We go to the fucking dealership. And then when we get to the dealership, the dude takes the title and says, I got to run the VIN number. He comes back white and he goes, you guys need to get out of here. When I ran that VIN number, it set off a thing with the police in the computer. They're on the way. Fuck. The car's reported stolen and that you kidnapped her. Wow. That's, That's what the, the mom parents did, said. Yeah. yeah, so then uh, we went back to L.A. and sold the car to her dealer for two ounces of blow, two plane tickets, and 500 bucks. And at this point, she started seeing how crazy I was that I was She's gonna, getting scared, probably, too. She was terrified. Of Where me. were the plane tickets, too? Uh, back to New York. Okay. So we were going to get clean. Where you were being hunted, also. Yeah, well, that's and how and how did you? What I'm made gonna you tell you. So we got on the plane, and she's acting weird. So at that time, they didn't look, they didn't X-ray your bags or nothing. So I put an ounce in the checked-in baggage, and then I've had an ounce in the overhead, you know, because mm -hmm. I wanted to do some bumps on the plane. <laughs> and then she's acting weird. I'm like, yo, what's up? She's like, nothing, nothing. I was like, what do you mean nothing? You haven't said anything in the last two hours. She had made a phone call in the airport when I said, who did you call? She goes, oh, I just told the drug dealer that we made it to the airplane, airport all right and that the plane tickets were all good. Uh -oh. So then I'm looking at her and then she starts fucking crying almost. I'm like, yo, what the fuck? I said, who the fuck did you call in the airport? She's her like, parents. I called my father Ugh. and told him what flight. Actually, he she called Nadine, her friend, who hated, uh, hated me and told her what flight we were on. And I knew the feds was going to be there when we landed. And you think I would be like, that's it. We're going to, you know, the first thing I said was we got to sniff all that coke in the overhead. <laughs> so I was going back to the bathroom on the fucking Shit. plane, sniffing boulders. Uh. I'm fucking sweating, like walking up and down the aisle. And I'm like, look at what the fuck you're eating. You're going to fucking be an animal in your next life. And reading like out of my mind like reading the six hours Bhagavad Gita like out loud <laughs> standing up like a fucking you know Krishna said in People chapter been like, 2 text 37 they must have been freaked out on that flight. yo they were like sit down or we're gonna have the cops come when I was like cops is already gonna yeah. be here <laughs> so I told her I said you're gonna walk ahead of me and they're gonna grab you it's gonna give me a three seconds moment to, to try to get away. So I put a baseball cap, shades. So we go down the jetway. And as soon as she gets into the terminal, it was like a rainy night in New York. I just see all these motherfuckers with trench coats fucking swarm on her. I merged in with this family and went down the escalator and fucking, you think I would leave the airport you went for your bag. And I went for my bag with the uh, other ounce. And well, I got this dude. I had the bag check thing. I'm like, yo, go get my bag. I got the cops after me. They went out looking for me outside. 
Never in a million years did they think this motherfucker's going to get his luggage. You're not going to leave his Coke behind. So then it was like, they went out, I went in. They came in, I went out. I got in a cab. I had the two ounces, all the money. And I went down to a fucking crack house in Alphabet City and was freebasing. And then these dudes hit me with a pipe and took all my shit. So I woke up. I went to Tompkins Square Park, sitting in the rain, fucked up, bloody, had motherfuckers looking for me everywhere, had nothing. That's rock bottom if there ever was one. That's below rock bottom. Yeah. That's under the rocks. And I went to the Krishna Temple in Brooklyn. I said, if you don't let me stay here, I'm going to be dead. And that was my climb out. I started training again. You went I got clean? off the drugs, yeah. And it was tough because I, I had to do a bike messenger job and I had to ride past all the motherfuckers that sold me crack. I had to start paying motherfuckers back that knew. It's a deep hole to get out of. Deep hole, deep hole, but I did it. And then I started really getting into the training and then like, you know, cycling, racing, and then swimming and running. and. So I wanted, I wanted to get into that. So now, during this whole run, so you said when you first had linked up with the Bad Brains, you went plant-based. Yeah. So during your whole drug run, I was that plant go to this shit? Really? Nope. Wow. So you I were... would wake up after three fucking days straight of free basin or Eating crap. sprouts. No, 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 no. I had to take pills to go to sleep. I would wake up and go, yo, let's go get some wheatgrass juice. <laughs> Motherfuckers would be like... Yeah. Wheatgrass juice, motherfucker. You need to be in a straight track somewhere. Like, they just see me do the wildest shit. Yeah, you worry about I your health now? I maintained my diet the That's entire amazing. fucking time that I was fucking using. And you're still plant based to this day? Still plant based to this day. How many years? But now? here's the thing. That's 20, 30 so years. So I got back with the Cro Mags in 90, and then Harley robbed the tour money again. He emptied out the bank account. After I gave him another chance. Jesus. And then I beat that motherfucker's ass. And he was a junkie at the time. So then to get out of my contract with the label that he signed me to as an individual artist, I had to go out and tour the album. Otherwise, they wasn't going to release me. Yeah. So I go honoring my contract. He starts calling up my house saying, motherfucker, I'm going to rat you out for everything you did and that you're AWOL and all this shit if you don't stop playing as the cro -Mags. Scumbag shit. So then in 95, St. Patty's Day, I see the motherfucker, and he was playing. He got up to play a song with that band Murphy's Law, and he's looking at me like he had gone to the cops that day. The next day they came to my house while I was on a job site, kicked in the fucking door. I lived with my brother. Looking for me. He ratted me out. I get a I get a text on my pager. I call back. They're like, ninth precinct, detective the grown. I'm like, I'm like, what? He's like, yo, is this John J. McGowan? And I'm like, motherfucker. You know a Harley Flanagan and a Paris Mitchell may you they, they press some bullshit charges on me. But you were five years clean at this point, right? Yeah, I was clean. But the thing was Old shit that ran. Then my brother calls. He's like, yo, 5 0 was just here. You need to get the. F don't come back here. So then I went down to DC and waited, and the be the scene did a benefit for me, and I, I turned myself in. And then I had to argue the whole Navy case. I spent like a month in the brig. Oh, you still had to deal with all the old cases? Yeah, but wow. I, the fact was, I, I called back. I said, look, Detective Negron, no offense to you, those charges are bullshit. I know you know I'm AWOL. I'm going to go down and deal with that first, and then I'll be back to face this shit. Because the deal is, if they catch you and then turn you over to the military, it's Big much difference. worse. Yeah. I turned myself in. And then they were able to argue conscientious objector and all that shit. So that's how I, I ended up beating the case. And I got uh, all my benefits and everything because, like, the psychological shit I should have... Like, you know, that I was going through and all that. Like, the military exam, uh, my my test, psychiatric uh, test. Yeah. They said I'm a time bomb waiting to go off when they had me in 1980. And then when they found out that it was kind of a fraudulent, like, that the dude lied about my whole past and everything, 
They drafted. The lawyer was able to argue all that shit, and then yeah, they gave me all my benefits and everything. Although I didn't take them, cause I'm like, I didn't serve. I'm not gonna be a burden on this government. Respect. Even though they was trying to give me all my medical benefits and everything. You, you know, there's a lot of it. lies being told. Yeah, he's he's a fucking deserter and he got a dishonorable discharge. And it, it, that's all bullshit. The fact you you could go and look up the whole shit. And they gave me a OTH at first, but then it got upgraded because I didn't get in any trouble. Other than honorable, and then it got upgraded. So it's basically I got a good conduct uh, discharge with all my benefits. I never, I never took them. I never took any of those benefits. I had all my own shit. I didn't. I, that's my. I, I was like, I ain't asking you for nothing, but I ain't giving you nothing. Yeah, that was my away, philosophy. I walked other. away fucking clean. And and then I tried to get back with him again in 2000. It was the same shit. So that's why I'm I'm you know I'm done with it. As a matter of fact, you have a new group now. Yeah, Blood Clot with dudes. Uh, we're recording an album. And uh, we, we were signed to Metal Blade, and then the guitar player OD'd and died. And we had dudes from the Queens of the Stone Age, Joey Castillo and Nick Oliveri. And then we were going to, we got another guitar player, Tom Capone from Quicksand. And we went out to LA. He was killing it. We're getting ready to play. And then, boom, pandemic hits. So I had to work with dudes on the yeah. East Coast. Been a fucked up year. Yeah, it's been crazy, but you know, I, 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 like, you know, I started a coaching business now, so I got into like mindset coaching. I, uh, I went to school for that. I trained for an Ironman. I completed the Ironman. Yeah, so that's I finished, what I wanted to I ask finished that. two books. Yeah, I wanted to ask. So, so I how... used my time during this whole last year to really try to better hone myself. in on that. Where yeah. did the transcript? So like, you we went through the. You obviously had a very crazy tumultuous childhood. Teenage years, or even early twenties, you you've seen a lot of shit. How did you kind? Because of, this is kind of what I like talking about is, you know, the crazy stories are fun to talk about and it makes you who you are. But the real good you're doing comes now, yeah. right? So since then you've gone completely plant based, and then you got into Iron Man racing, which is extremely intriguing to me. The first time I actually I had known the name the Crow Mags before, but it's not my genre of music. Yeah. I never really got like too deep into it before that. You first came into my eyes really, uh, watching Brian Rose. Yeah, and a London real guy. So he, so you were training him for the Iron Man. And how for did a half you, Iron Man? Yeah, half that Iron was Man. a seventy point three. I know he says he did an Iron Man, but, but how uh, did you get into Iron Man? Racing? I'm gonna tell you because so my late uncle, Uncle Rocco, he was he was like when I would get in trouble on the streets, he was always there for me when we would have a visit from the foster home. Like one time, my mother tried to commit suicide. Uh, Cause we we asked her we wanted to come home and we were on a home visit from the fucked up home, and then we had to call him and he came over, and and, and she tried to take a bunch of pills and like kill herself. He was the uncle that was there. And for he you. was the uncle that was there for us. So his he's first generation Italian. So when I used to go to his house when I was on the streets in the eighties, we would always watch the Paris Roubaix or the Tour de France. Like he was big into cycling. He used to cycle. Su- be like a legit cyclist yeah and then he's like oh come over and we're gonna watch the iron man like this competition in hawaii and i just saw what these motherfuckers did in the race and like people fucking beating cancer and like just the stories i cried man i was like it was i mean i get goosebumps to this day i see him and i'm like Wow, man! I said I want to do that. Isn't that where something just hit, just resonate with you different? Like those things that that moment transformed yeah. the rest of your life. Well, yeah, this was like I, I it was the I caught like I think it was the Iron War between Dave Scott and uh, Mark Allen, and it was just so fucking inspiring. Like, and the thing was when I was I, I went to a pool when I was a kid, and I got stuck behind the ladder. And I almost died. I almost drowned. So Swimming's the dude at the thing, pool told me, you go right back and get back in that fucking water. And I became this expert fucking swimmer. Oh, wow. So even on my ship in the Navy, when we had man overboard drills, I was the rescue swimmer. Like, I just fucking swimming was like, and I was a great runner and all this. And cyclist, I was a bike messenger. Then I used to go race in Central Park at night. What year did you put it all together? Uh... I started, the first thing I did was the Marine Corps Marathon in 2007. And I beat out the whole run group with a torn hamstring. (laughs) And then I was like... 
What happens to that for mental fortitude? So there's this... Well, we played a show the night before in Baltimore, and that's where I tore my hamstring. Moshing? No, I was on stage playing, and the fucking club was freezing. So I'm, like, very active on stage, and yeah, I was running up. across the stage, <laughs> and I felt my left hamstring. So they came and picked me up from D.C., right? Because it's down in D.C. So I went to the hotel. I took duct tape. And I just put it around the whole fucking quad and, and hamstring. By any fucking means. Do you and guys I got that? out there and I did a four four o two in the marathon. And it was this tattoo club in D.C. And it was like 12 or 14 of us. And I beat every single one of them. And with a torn hamstring. With a torn hamstring. And the thing was... What year was this? 2007. I did the oh, Marine okay. Corps Marathon. And then, uh, so I wanted to, you know, the Iron Man shit was always there. And then, like, I I kept seeing races coming up and I never pulled the trigger. So there was this brother, black dude named Orion Mims, and he's like a legend in the fitness shit. Like, he's fucking diesel. He boxed. He's an Iron Man. He did, like, Iron Mans all over the world. I kept hearing about him. New York guy? I, yeah. Tough motherfucker, man. I love this brother, man. He's we're like fucking brothers and shit. And then um, I ran into him in Sid's bikes, and I was like, "Yo, man, I fucking heard so much about you." And we became friends. And he started teaching me how to train. And then he's like, "Yo, 2012." He's like, "Yo, I got us in an Ironman, New New York City Ironman, 2012." We're going to race for the Brain Aneurysm Foundation. We raised 5000 We got a slot. Wow. Motherfucker started training me. They did a write-up on me in Triathlete Magazine. You train with the best now. 10-hour Ironman. Fuck Like, it, fucking... Hey. Those you don't know who the Ironman is. So, what are the, I don't know what the distances are, it's but it's swimming, point, running, and cycling. It's a 2.4-mile swim. I, then you get out of the water, you bike 112 miles. 112 miles. And then you run miles. a 26.2-mile marathon. So, you run a marathon after swimming yeah. a couple miles and biking, yeah. it, basically, it's, from it's here to the nice city. It's a nice day in oh, the park, God. you know? <laughs> <laughs> but this, training with him, this brother's like 6'5". So, like... Beast. His one fucking stride, I would be like... My short ass, I'm 5'9", it would yeah, be like, da, 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 I'd have to do like five steps to keep up with him. But we would go running 20 miles. He had me pulling a parachute, like the whole fucking shit. Like, real deal training. Real deal motherfucker, man. And I didn't get up on the apps and all that shit yet, like the training peaks and the heart rate monitor. Yeah. He just had me beasting through it. So it was August 11th, 2012. The thing was, our drummer who booked the Crow Mags at the time got the schedule mixed up and booked a big festival Same for day. August 10th, the night before my Ironman in Philly. So I had to, I wasn't going to cancel either. I went down there. We played a sold out show to like 3,000 people. My brother drove me down. My brother drove me back. I didn't sleep. I had a stress fracture in my foot. Fuck. I went and took a shower. And caught the last ferry to Ross Dock where the swim start. You would catch another ferry to go up to the ferry where you jumped off the fucking boat and start the swim start. So I caught the last ferry and I went and I, I fuck. It was 90 something degrees humidity in August. No sleep. And I went out there and finished that motherfucker. It took me like 13 hours, but. But you fucking finished that. I got That's that, that motherfucker finished, man. That, and and the, then I just. Started signing up. Then I did Got Cabo. Hooked. Then I just fucking started. I traveled to Taiwan. I did Mexico. I did How Australia. How many have you done now? I did 12 wow. fulls, including bragging rights. Kona World Championship, in which Hawaii. is the big dance. That's like, that's one of the hardest one-day endurance races in the world. The course is brutal. 40-mile-an-hour fucking headwinds on the Fuck. bike. You know, it's like 130 That's degrees. the Super Bowl of Ironmans? Super Bowl Ironman. I did That's that twice. Dope. I'm the opposite when it comes to that shit. 2016, 2017, I did Kona. I placed the uh, top 10% in my age group a few years ago in the world in Ironman. Wow. Uh, I made all-world athlete. And then, like, I got injured. I raced... 
that race with Brian Rose, I had three hernias. Far. So I last year I got my hernias fixed. How was Brian Rose? He seems you know, like a cool guy. He's he's all right, man. You know, he's all right. He's running for mayor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm not down with any of the shit he's doing now, but whatever. Like, all right. You know. Uh, Another day. But, uh, you know. When it comes to Iron Man, like, the, the mental fortitude was built. I mean, that's something that only very few people are capable of that. I, I, I myself, I think if I put my head to it, I, think, I don't think there's anything I couldn't accomplish. But I, I train for short burst type of stuff. So I thought of swimming. At first, I, I'm stuck at swimming. I thought of swimming 200 yards, never mind two miles, would be too much for me. But a marathon after all that, where like I, I watch like guys like Cameron Haynes and, and Goggins, and like I watch Goggins, this shit. I, 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 let me tell you about Goggins, man. Goggins did Kona, and he parachuted out of a fucking plane into the water, swam I don't know how many miles in with other seals, and then got and did the Ironman and still did it in like under 11 hours. He's a fucking machine. My friend trained. There's, there's a guy. He's famous in, in the SEAL community. He was in Act of Valor. I don't know if you saw that Yeah, movie. I saw the movie, yeah. So the Muay Thai fighter, the black dude. I don't dude, remember, to be honest with you. But I won't say his name because he gets out soon. And I, I, but anyway, Goggins uh, ran the machine gun course in the Salt and Flats, right? So if you go out from L.A. and you're flying back and you go over the salt and flats, you're going to see a compound. That's a SEAL compound. So they go out there and he runs the machine gun course. So my friend told me, this is Goggins. He would get up at 2 in the morning, run 20 miles, get on his bike, ride 30 miles to work or whatever, 30, 40 miles, run all the SEALs into the fucking ground. The fittest motherfuckers on the planet, and Goggins would be there in a coat and pants. And they already done a marathon and a bike ride. And and these dudes are there in shorts and Bates boots and a fucking t-shirt or whatever, and Goggins would run them into the ground. And then bike home. Bike home and do it again <laughs> the next day. That's next level savagery, man. I just thought it, that, that guy's just built different. He just does yeah. not listen to the voice in his head that tells him if to stop. If you don't know his book, You Can't Hurt Me, I swear to God, get it. Listen to it on audio if you need a kick in the ass. I ran into Goggins twice. I, I texted, I posted it up the other day, the first time I met him. And he goes, he commented on my Instagram page. He goes, stay hard. Stay that's hard, what yeah. he told me. Yeah. I said, yo, I was just about to call it a day. It was snowing and raining. I already biked 50 miles. I'm train I was supposed to go do hill repeats, like up and down and up and down. And I was all wet. It was like March, snowing, rain mix. He gave you a second one. I'm wind. like, fuck. I'm about to turn off the West Side Highway bike path. I see this motherfucker charging toward me with nothing but a pair of shorts on, cock fucking diesel, hauling ass toward me. When he gets close enough, I'm like, that's fucking Goggins. And he had just done the Rich Roll podcast, and I told him, yeah, my friend trained with you, and he knew who it was because, you know, there ain't that many black Navy SEALs, so they all, you know. But um, I was like, yo, man, I was just getting ready to, he did Rich Roll's podcast. I was like, that shit was so inspiring. And he was on London Real. So, like, I was like, yo, man, I was just getting ready to turn the fuck off the highway and be a bitch and go home and get soup in a shower. And now I'm going to finish. He goes, that's on. He was like, I forget. Something like, that's unsatisfactory. Stay hard, motherfucker. <laughs> and, he like, and then I'm looking at my Garmin, and he's fucking running 12 miles an hour. Like. For days. Like. Those ultra marathons they do, like 200 miles. He did miles. bad water. 134 fucking miles in like 120 degree heat. Right. He's an animal. Like, but there's those type of guys. That's who I try to surround myself with these days by the. I'm not, you know, I'm not just, I don't, I, I don't get to hang out with him. I'm just saying, like, I try to pick the brains of, like, yeah. those type of motherfuckers. Like, I wrote that book, The PMA Effect, and it's... Super interesting to me. So, yeah. you're, this is, the, is your third book? That was my third book. I just finished my fourth and my fifth, and I'm working on my sixth book now. The fourth fifth out yet, or no? No, it's coming out. Okay, so the, uh, you had The Evolution of a Cro-Magnon. Evolution Cro of a Cro-Magnon, Meat is for Pussies, which Meat was is a for comedy pussies. book. And then, uh, and then the it's PM. not a vegan book, Joe. I was on Joe Rogan, and he's like, 
Yeah, but you're a vegan. I was like, I ain't no fucking vegan, man. I fucking, I can't stand most of those motherfuckers. I even put a chapter vegan, the five letter curse word. Like, yeah, because I mean, you're not, you're not someone who's like super pushy about it. You know what I mean? Well, Which is it's a not problem. just that. They're just judgmental. That's what I mean. Like, like, they fucking, seem to be looking like down everybody. I'm like the elitists and yeah. I'm out there feeding fucking the homeless since 80 fucking two. You know, like I'm down in the fucking trenches with motherfuckers. And I said, I honestly... You know, would rather hang out with fucking motherfuckers that eat McDonald's than most of those people. The serious snobby vegans. Yeah, it's yeah. just like when, the, when the, we do a, a food drive. My friend runs once a week uh, in the city when it opens back up. We come. That's actually how I met her. Uh, every Wednesday night we go and see the homeless. See that you do good things, you meet good people. Yeah, it definitely comes back around. But uh, the PMA effect, so it's the it's positive mental attitude, yeah. right? And something that I actually mean her say to us sometimes when we're around the house or we're getting like pissy or whatever so, about something trivial, stupid yeah. bullshit. It's like. All right, this is nothing. This problem is yeah. nothing. Keep our positive head on because there's nothing That's good the from being negative. That's the way to think, man. You know? And, like, we just did a documentary called 30 to Life with uh, Kip Anderson. I, listen, I just want to say, it ain't all the people that call themselves vegans, whatever the fuck. I just don't use that label. There's a lot of cool motherfuckers no, in course, that space, that too. But... You know, they get a vegan, bad rep. vegan, that's why you always say, well, they're un yeah, because they're unhealthy because vegan tells me what you don't eat. It doesn't tell me what you eat. Yeah. See, I eat a whole food, plant-based, organic diet. That's a big fucking difference. Not all vegan diets are equal. They're fucking eating fucking- Bunch of carbs and they get they, fat. Well, no. not just that. They just eat hydrogenated oils. Yep. They don't give a fuck. GMOs. Now you got these vegan fucking doctors telling you fucking GMOs are safe and pesticides- like, just, that's why I don't fuck with them. I've been studying this shit longer than most of them motherfuckers been alive. Yeah, when I, when I got too. into it in 81, I went down a scientific fucking wormhole to know what the fuck every single thing was that I was talking about. And now there's, a, there's, there's big money in it now, so it gets it gets yeah. corrupted like everything yeah. else. Now they're like Beyond Meat yeah. is now getting in trouble. Yeah, beyond, well, Impossible Burger is getting that's in right, trouble. That's right, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry Impossible beyond. Burger. Push shit in there that the FDA didn't like even the fake approve. fake blood. Yeah, fake blood. What the fuck? I need fake. And you know what? <laughs> I ate that shit and I had stomach problems for two days. So that's why I say, yo, I'm so clean with what the fuck I do. If I eat some shit, that's all. You can tell. And I didn't know it was GMO. If I knew that, I wouldn't have eaten it. But like, I just, I just try to eat clean. And Beyond Meat is the one that's non-GMO and like they don't use soy isolates. So they're like a better version of all of that type stuff but still i'd rather make my own veggie burgers from scratch yeah because all that processed we and, gotta know what's in it and packaged shit is expensive yeah that that's too. that's the devil's in the details if you try to eat that shit you're gonna be spending an arm and a leg on you on your food i just made a whole thing of veggie burgers for eleven dollars and we made like 20 something veggie burgers and you could store them in the freezer and hungry. all of that. And I got a YouTube channel, The Hard Truth with John Joseph, and there's all recipes and like all kinds of cool shit. It's a shit. Cooking, uh, cooking channel? Yeah, cooking, but talking shit. Too. So you're one of those people who, super, who fascinates me too because you, you defy the, the fallacy that like vegans can't be performance athletes. Like you, like Nate Diaz, like there's a lot of misconceptions, especially I come from like a bodybuilding background. Jake Shields. Yeah, I come from a bodybuilding background where people, it's like, you know, it's all meat, 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 and they think that thing is vegan is weak. Uh, but clearly, if you got guys like you, guys like them, they can perform at the level you can. If it's done the correct way, right. it can be, you can still perform at whatever level There's you want. There's a to. movie on Netflix called The Game Changers, mm -hmm. and it's all world class fucking athletes that are all playing. I actually. Uh, got filmed for about 14 hours. I was going to be in the movie. And then all the vegan feminists and the other motherfuckers that don't like me because I have a book that was called Meat is for Pussies. <laughs> fucking, they got me. They, they canned it. Well, they, 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 the social justice warriors came out against me. And I had a Lululemon campaign for their men's line. They got that pulled. Jesus they Christ. They fucking just went after every single thing that I was doing. And they found out about it. Even my documentary, 30 to Life, with Kip Anderson, who did What the Health and Cowspiracy, and Paul DeGelder, the Special Forces Australian clearance diver that had his leg and arm taken off by the bull shark. He's always on the Discovery Channel during yeah. Shark Week. I came up with the concept. So, and I took it to Paul. We worked on it and took it to, um, 
We took it to Kip Anderson. He took it to his finances that Friday. We got the funding to do the documentary. I get this call Monday. He's like, yo, we have big problems. I was like, what do you mean? What problems? He's like, dude, the funding's getting pulled because of your book. I said, what book? They, he goes, meat is for pussies. I was like, these motherfuckers, man. Those people that you know what it is, it's, it's easier to no destroy. Life. It's easier to destroy than they it is got to create. No life. You know what I'm saying? like, motherfucker, y'all don't do nothing for nobody except criticize and try to tear yeah. people down. All you motherfucking cancel culture motherfuckers. Like, if I don't agree with somebody, I step the fuck off. I yeah. don't try to ruin their life. And that's what they tried to do to me. But obviously, the shit didn't work because I told them all to go fuck themselves. And I still tell them to go fuck themselves because I'm a New Yorker. <laughs> and like I said, don't start none, there won't be none. Yeah. The bitch that was doing that shit, because that's what she is, a bitch, had a blog. And I go, yo, anybody who has been helped by my book, please write this woman and tell her something. And it was all these chicks that bought the book for their dude that never would have listened to nothing except I had take a certain vernacular and they do what I shape do from it. and they wrote her shit and, and fucking shut her blog the fuck down cause nice. she got so many emails like why don't you mind your fucking business you don't do <laughs> nothing but rag out motherfuckers and try to ruin people's lives and, and he's actually helping people with his books yeah dude they shot me for the Lululemon campaign and all this shit and the same shit happened man fucking like That's they disgrace. had built fucking huge cutouts of me in the in their office in, in like their main office like and then i just went from that to getting canceled i'm like this is what the fuck they do so that's why i, I don't like most of them motherfuckers and then you get dudes like oh yeah yeah you know i'm a i'm a feminist i'm like you still ain't getting laid up you i was like you still ain't getting laid you hard up motherfucker go f get the f like, I just tell motherfuckers straight up. People like that are weasels a lot of times. Sometimes they have good intentions. Most of the times, people like that, they're just looking for an angle. That's how I feel like. Well, you know what I say? You judge something by the result. My book got thousands of motherfuckers. They did the same shit to Rory Friedman, who wrote Skinny Bitch. That book saved millions of girls' lives by getting them off the poison food, the breast cancer, all of that shit. But that wasn't enough for them. They fucking tried to cancel her because she used the word bitch and used the word skinny. And that ain't, it's just like nowadays. Look what the fuck is going on nowadays. It's, it's insane what the fuck is going yeah, on. If you don't fit into an ideology that's this narrow, then you're not allowed that's to speak anymore. That's why I tell them all to go fuck themselves. You go and talk shit on my page, I just block you. I give you, you know, I'll give you a little... Slap and send you on your motherfucking way. <laughs> you know, a hype, you know, not not an actual slap. No, it a digital slap. Because, you know, the ones that talk shit online, when you see them, they're like little fucking church mice. Yeah. Oh, man. Hey, dude. Big fan. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, what about... uh The shit you were talking the other day. Let, let's circle back six months back. <laughs> I got that memory, motherfucker. <laughs> like, yeah. But, shit. you know, I just try to, like, Pay shit forward and help people and like just be. What's your um? So you're doing the uh, you're doing the um the coaching now. Yeah, so I where started. Can people find uh, you? I don't call it life coaching. I do more like discipline coaching, mindset coaching. Where can they find you for that? So if you go on my website, johnjosephdiscipline.com. I'll put the link below run, in the video. I run courses. Like I got a a Kickstarter class. I do one on one. I got a 21 day crash course. Like you know, it's all different. Um, you know aspects to it i'm writing a book on discipline now i have a 10-step process like i picked the minds of like the most fucking successful motherfuckers in business and sports and whatever and developed this like 10-step program to becoming more disciplined so i got that book coming out when's four and five coming out uh this probably late sp spring Okay. Something like that. When one's it comes a cook, out, we'll put out links one's to that. One's a cookbook, and then the other is A to Z, how to completely change your health and do it on the cheap and all of that That's shit. And the latest That's medical it. facts, you know, like what's going on with the spike in type 2 diabetes or even the spike that's happening right now in colon cancer because 
in young adults who were physically active motherfuckers because really? they're listening to people like Sean Baker who's doing the carnivore diet and the rest of this shit and eating nothing but meat and saying vegetables and fruits even though they've been eating it for fucking thousands and thousands of years to be healthy these motherfucking new diet gurus come up with some made up shit you don't need anything except for meat <laughs> and because people initially they go on one type of food and eliminate all the others so yes yeah, some health problems are going to turn around but at the expense of what yeah it's not balanced because down the road if you watch forks over knives all of that animal protein you're looking at type 2 diabetes arterial sclerosis, high blood pressure, heart disease, colon cancer. That's why now there's a huge spike in colon cancer in young adults. Why is that happening? Why is that happening? Where is that? Because they're eating all this shit because these mamalukes are fucking telling them, yeah, you could just fucking eat meat every fucking meal. <laughs> you know, a piece of broccoli is fucking poison. Like Sean Baker, like, he's a fucking orthopedic. Go fix some feet, motherfucker. <laughs> the, like, you know. Do you supplement at all? Yeah. What else, what else do you take? What kind of supplements so, do you take? Uh, well, Joe Rogan just had this, like, a virologist doctor on and talked, you know, with the shit that's going on right now. Yeah. So uh, I go on the offensive, so I take uh, quercetin. Um, also... Uh, Vitamin D3, all, all plant-based sources. D3 is probably the most and, important and, vitamin no one and takes. And zinc. Zinc, yep. And right, C. so I do those three, and then I do, uh, I do, uh, you know, I'm training hard right now, so, like, I do a plant-based um, multivitamin, and then, you know, I do, like, organ protein powder. Which Vegan is, protein? Yeah, well, it's it's... It's not just vegan. It's like superfoods. Everything's organic. There's no soy isolates. It tastes great. So then I do that and, and um, you know, some organic probiotics and stuff like that. But I try to get most of my shit from food. Yeah. That's, you know, most of my stuff comes because I, I, I eat clean. I love cooking. My girl loves cooking. I got a good recovery drink that I make that I, gotta, I forgot to bring today that I got to send to you. It's uh, it's got everything for post workout recovery, all plant based, nice. organic. All right. Yeah, and I and I also do like apple cider vinegar Love that. and all that type. You that's know. my that's my secret weapon. Yeah. Oh, it's great. Like, cause, you know, especially when you get older, like s apple cider vinegar will remove the the crystals that form on the joints for pre arthritis and all this shit. It helps me too when I'm feeling like under the weather. If I feel like I'm about to get yeah. sick. I always take apple cider vinegar. It almost always knocks and, out And oregano starts. oil. I'm on that shit. My father loves that shit. My father's There's old school There's a company called Gaia, and they do it in the... Because I tried doing the... That, you do the drops, that shit will burn you like crazy, man. It's like, whoa. You think the capsules? Yeah, it's, it's plant-based capsules. And then the, the... And my girl found out, like, if you get a sore throat, you take fucking oregano oil before you go to bed and you rub it on the bottom of your feet and put socks on and the next fucking morning your sore throat's gone <laughs> it absorbs fuck? through your feet that's bizarre that's fucking we gotta try yeah. that next time oh it works Shit, I believe but then it. I got like a I'll filtration a system reverse osmosis for the water under the sink mm. has a big holding tank and so I cook with that, and like you know, I just I just try to live right, man. And and I'm drug free, alcohol free. I'm an addict for life. Like I said, I tell everybody that's having addiction issues. I'm just I'm choosing not to use today. But you know, the mind is crazy as a motherfucker. Like you know, I heard this dude. My friend was like, "Yo, this motherfucker gets like kilos and shit." I was in his house. He had like thirty kilos of blow. Some crazy motherfucker I know. And immediately my mind was like, I could rob that motherfucker. I'll be freebasing for like three months. <laughs> like that thought actually came it's still in there. my head. It's still there. Because it's just wildness. Yeah. But it's like you got to beat your mind with a stick. Shut the fuck up. That's where the training helps too, I'm sure. Yeah. It helps silence those I fucking voices. I replaced all of that with the positive. A better addiction. I do yoga, I meditate. I'm up like two hours before the sunrise every day. Always looking to help people. I opened a yoga center for 10 years and paid for it, did all the construction. So I just try to, like, you know, 
try to always be there to pay it forward, man. Like so well, many people helped me in my life. And that's the whole thing that like Prabhupada and everybody said, like that's who brought Hare Krishna in the purest form to America. That's why everybody followed it because he was a pure devotee. He slept on the floor. He had no possessions. He fed everybody that would come to the programs in the early days in the 60s before he would take a grain of rice himself. He was the personification of humility yeah. and just tried to help people. Came from India, 70, 70 years old, with $7 and a case of books to the Lower East Side. Think about that. That's fucking unbelievable. You talk about faith in God and then just wanting to help people. So that was the whole thing is you can't pay that back. You pay it forward. You have you help the next person in line. I like that, and you've come a long way. Clearly, from the stories and how you know what your life was like as a kid, and even as a young adult, to where you're at now. Obviously, complete transformation, yeah. and not only with yourself helping yourself and becoming healthy, but putting it out there for other people to help themselves. And you know, uh, it's it's. I talk to my my younger brother. I'm like, I don't. I'm like, when 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 you call me, and it says Veterans Administration, and I know at the caller ID that you're in the motherfucking detox, I'm gonna fuck with you. Until then, it's tough love. But I talk with my older brother a lot. He's plant-based, he's clean and sober. My mom's plant-based. And, you know, me and E talk about shit and I'm like, yo, sometimes you have to just like, yo, can you believe the shit we went through? Like a different life. It's insane. Yeah. It's fucking, when I got the, when my memoir came out, the motherfuckers from the Village Voice called me, and I went and met with the writer at Kate's Joint, which was a vegan restaurant on Avenue B and 4th, and I met him there, and he slides the book across the table, and he's like, dude, come on. I was like, what? He's like, and and it's because all these fake memoirs came We're out. not believing you? A million little pieces and just bullshit artists. He's like, dude, there's no way that this book is true. And you're, I was like, I said, dude. I didn't say dude. I said, motherfucker. <laughs> I left like, stories I, out of that thing. Never mind. I left stories up. out of that <laughs> motherfucker. Yeah. And I was like, well, how, he goes, well, how can I verify that it's true? I said, I'll give you all the fucking numbers to my mother, my brother. You could go to fucking, you could go to fucking uh, Bupers in D.C. and check my military shit. Any fucking thing you want. Yeah. He's like, well, give me... I said, all right. So out of everybody that I gave him, he didn't call one person. You know, he called my ex-band member to, to try to turn the article into like... A hit piece a, or something. A, no, a beef, a yeah. Cro-Mag beef article. I was like... He's like, well, I called up uh, blah, 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 and here's what he had to say, and what's your response? I said, you want to know my response, motherfucker? I'm going to come over to the Village Voice and throw you out of the third floor window. How the <laughs> fuck you like that? I said, Did you, you didn't even call my mother. You didn't call nobody. You called him? Yeah, that's an agenda. And then, because Rob Harvilla was the music guy from The Voice, so he tried to turn it into this... I said I didn't do I didn't write this book to be for there to be beef. Yeah. But it's so many bullshit stories. I had to clear the path and tell the real Chromag stories because motherfucker has been lying against me forever. And even went on Jocko's podcast and lied. And the thing is, is like that's why I told the story. And the story is to help people. And that's what you trying to turn this into. And then I said, yo, fuck that article, man. I don't even want that shit to come out. Fuck you. And when I see you, it's on. And then uh, it, it pissed me off. I imagine. Because yeah. he called me up. And then, like, all of a sudden, I get a call. My mother didn't even know I wrote the book. My mother calls me, and she's like, uh, yeah, I just got a call from this guy from the newspaper. I was like... What she goes? Oh yeah, this guy Rob. And I I said, well, what what did he say? he he wanted to know if all the shit in your book is true? And I said, yeah, it's absolutely true. He he had a list. I said, yep, yep, yep. And then I walked past. They had they used to have the Village Voice boxes on the street. Yeah. And the next morning, like Wednesday morning, I walked past it and I look and I'm like, I did a double take. 
I got the cover of The Voice, and it <laughs> said, the, the, the brutal life and times of John Joseph, the blood clot diaries. Oh, so they ran it the right way eventually. And it was with a microphone with blood dripping off of it. Yeah. That's dope. And he wrote in there, that, yeah, he threatened my life. <laughs> like basically, if anything happens to me. <laughs> That's funny. He didn't want this article to come out. Uh, you know, hardly uh, seems to still, you know, of course he's good. Yeah, uh, yeah, I robbed the band like how many times and uh, ratted him out to the military and uh, like yeah, what's he know, gonna say? Yeah, come on, man, you know. But anyway, water under the bridge now. Keeping that. Hey, <laughs> yeah, I don't give a fuck. Keeping keep, that PMA. I keep the PMA, but you know the truth is the truth. So that's. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna put all the links to where people can find you down there, especially for that mental coaching. I think obviously some with your mental capacity and fortitude is someone worth learning from. Uh, any other links after me and you will speak? I yeah. put that to get a hold of you. John Anything, Joseph Cromag, Instagram. You know, you'll be tagged in all the on all the social media. Anything else that you be looking forward to coming out soon? Uh, I got a TV show I'm writing on. I got the documentary Thirty to Life that's going to be coming on Netflix. We worked with. When's that coming out? Uh, n this year, sometime okay, nice. I believe. I'm supposed to. I'm supposed to look get out. seen. Uh, a trailer soon, but we worked with inmates in California who did over 20 years in prison, and we fucking got him meditating and plant-based wow. diet. Paul DeGelder had him jumping out of airplanes. and <laughs> fu Dude, it's fucking wild, I can't bro. wait to see that. Well, we're running a little over on time now. That's all right. What time is it? It's, uh, I know you got to run soon. It's yeah. 3.45. Oh, so. I got to get downtown. I yeah. got a client. All right, but yo, thank you for coming in, man. I appreciate hey, you. We got to get this New done. York, baby. New York, motherfuckers, <laughs> Diesel too. Look at that shit. <laughs> thank you guys for tuning in. We'll be in uh, later in this week. Another episode. See All you right, later. Cool.